Shanna. And what's your company called? Community Cultivated. Community Cultivated. Okay. I'm just thinking how I'm going to do this little intro piece. You can always film the intro later. Hmm. But it doesn't matter. Cool. <laughs> Yeah. But I always say like starting a hard a podcast is the hardest part. It's like if you can just get like your first two sentences in and then you're like good to go. But getting those first two sentences, it's like what are those first two sentences of the very first podcast ever? Maybe they can be the ones you just said. Maybe they could be. I like it. It's like who's on the podcast today, Sam? Uh huh name is shanna she does community stuff and you want to talk to her that's about it that's all we need the rest of, it's all in the show notes we got it so what do you mean by community stuff yeah so community stuff for me is helping people serve their community better so that they can get better conversions keep their customers longer it's when i explain it to people who aren't in the online space i'm like i teach people how to be humans online because we're all really good at having real authentic relationships in person and serving people and creating connections for people. And then we get online and it just gets formulaic, right? We start having posting schedules and I don't know. It's like we just lose our human side. We forget how to get people to do things. And I don't know. So, Yeah. That's what I do is I specifically help people with online programs, build stronger communities so they can increase retention. Why do you think it got weird or people are weird about it? You know, psychologically, there's a lot of data that tells us that we need this. Like mm. we need the in person. There's so much that happens when you're sitting in a room with somebody that can't happen when you're looking at some profile picture online. And so we've created in technology, we've created this interesting dichotomy where we have a barrier between the humanness of the person that we're talking to and our brain wants all of those other psychological touch points that it doesn't get. And at the same time, we have this incredible opportunity because we can connect with more people than we've ever been able to connect with before, which increases our ability to have an impact. But I also think for a lot of people creates this, this struggle with how do you actually scale connection and relationships with people? So what's your solution? Yeah. Um, it, it's pretty simple and it doesn't come from the online space. It just comes from what I've seen in studying communities since the dawn of time, like this is community building is nothing new. And I think we really, we struggle when we try and create new concepts for the online space without looking at just generally in history, how do humans behave? And so I, I have this, this framework that basically is formulated around four things. And the first one being cause, and that's, do we have a common purpose and a common mission as a community? Like what is the North star that we're working towards? And if you look at all big movements that have happened, if you look at more recent ones like black lives matter, if you look at, you know, um, ones before that, where it, you know, you have like the civil rights movement, you have, um, political movements, you have religious movements. It all has formulated around having a common cause, women's right to vote, whatever it might be. And so how do we unite people around that, give people a common vision and purpose? And then secondly is culture. What are the beliefs, behaviors, and boundaries that define who we are? People want to know, especially now more than ever, like who are you and what do people like us do if we're here for this purpose and you're my people? What does that look like? What am I signing up for? That's where we get that identity. You know, a lot of people talk about, you got to give people an identity, but it's so vague. It's like, okay, so do I just give them a name, right? Mm. And now all of a sudden they have an identity. An identity comes from having a clear purpose and understanding the culture 
in which I'm thriving. So having those two things, I think is the most important one. It's the stuff that most people don't do. And then the, the other two elements are communication. How do I communicate to you? How do I hear from you? And then how do I help you communicate with each other? And then the fourth element is the connection piece. And the biggest mistake people make with connection is forgetting that connection always starts with safety. If we don't feel safe, we can't connect. Um, we, as creatives, oftentimes we don't like structure. We don't like leadership, but those things are required for people to feel safe. And if we want people to be vulnerable, share authentically to trust, then we need to have safety. That just goes back to basic psychology and Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So how do you actually do that? Like, let's say, well, I'm, I'm kind of interested because I've got online communities, right? Yeah. And we're, well, I'm, I'm really interested in the safety part first. So like, how do you do that? Like, I've got an online community. How do I even measure if there is safety or sense if there is safety? Yeah. Um, the the first piece is safety comes from two things. One is trust and one is clarity, right? So trust is authenticity and integrity. You are who you say you are and you do what you'll say you'll do. And as much as it shouldn't be unique, it is. Um, it really is unique for people to be somebody that follows through on the things that they're going to do and that they show up authentically. Now, authentically doesn't mean that you have to share everything and share your life, but who you portray inside of your community is really who you are. And when you go first and you do that, even pushing that, that barrier of what people might be comfortable with, you're giving your community permission to do it. So you have to trust your community first before they're going to trust you. So pretty practical example. We can start this kind of trust relationship and establishing with a welcome post in the community. So you have a welcome post and you could just say, hey, introduce yourself. I don't know about you, but anytime I've ever been in a room of people and somebody just vaguely tells me to introduce myself, I just kind of white face, no idea what to say, uh, stumble on my words. We want to give people very clear directions on introducing themselves. So introduce yourself below by answering like these three questions. And you start with something really easy. Like, where are you from? Then you kind of move a little bit more personal. Like why, why did you join this community? And then with that third question, you try and get them to push that boundary of comfort just a little bit, right? So you might ask something, what do you think is the going to be the biggest challenge to you reaching your goals in this program mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. Or if you um, look back a year from now and you have reached your goal, how does that impact the people that you love? So those are the, the types of questions that reveal a little bit about somebody. It takes you from being just a number to being a human, right? With internal needs, external relationships. And so when we have a post like that and we go first in sharing those things about us, right? Um, and then we connect genuinely with people when they share them, we're building that trust relationship because they've they've just like gone out on a ledge and said, I'm going to put myself out there. Is anybody going to catch me? And so often we ask people to put themselves out there, but we don't actually catch them. They're not, they don't feel heard. They don't feel seen. They don't feel accepted. And it's pretty easy to help people feel that. And it's just by acknowledging what they've said, being curious, asking more. So I really love when people have a welcome post like that and they go deeper. They don't just let the welcome post be something that gets more engagement in their Facebook group or something. Like you, you hear that all the time, like, oh, have a post, tell people to post a GIF or whatever it might be because it gets more engagement. But when we have people post answers to these questions and we go in the comments and we ask them, tell me more about that. I'm curious. Why is that important to you? We're establishing this trust that's built over one communication back and forth over time. Mm. Right? Got it. And is there a way to know if like your members of your community are experiencing 
like if you have a safety issue or not because it seems like yeah. an important thing like what are some signs i guess that you have a safety issue yeah so one of the signs that you have a safety issue is when you've had high engagement in your community um with people coming i i will say this you can have surface level high engagement right but where you know you really have trust is when people are coming when things aren't all like rainbows and unicorns they're not just coming with their wins they're coming with their mess they're coming with things that they don't have figured out and you know that that's the only place they're talking about that problem or concern or asking that question right that's when you know you have trust and you'll start to see that go away when trust is broken and it's not necessarily you've broken that trust but there can be people in the community that make your community unsafe for others and this can be a hard concept for community creators but to realize that your responsibility is actually to the community as a whole not the individual so it puts us in this tough position sometime where we end up having to play the bouncer role um, to protect the community at large. But there can be people in communities that, I mean, call them a know-it-all, call them critical, call them whatever you want, that can make others feel unsafe and sharing. And you'll notice people stop sharing as mm. much. Um, that's one of the biggest indicators Another indicator is that you're not hearing what people want more of or what they want to see less of. So if people stop talking to you, that could be an indicator that you've stopped, either stopped conversation with them. So you, you haven't opened that channel. And I think it's really important that we always keep that clear and open channel with our community or that for whatever reason, there's something that you've done that your community now feels unsafe to express concern or um unhappiness with your product or your your program or whatever it might be so if everybody thinks that everything you're doing is awesome and you never hear anybody complain you never hear anybody saying but what about this or why did you do it that way you probably lost trust it's just like a, a human imagine your marriage right mm. so you and your wife like she just tells you how awesome you are all the time and you never have a disagreement and you never have to have a deeper conversation to get aligned around, you know, whatever your next decision is around your kid or whatever it might be. You'd probably know like, okay, so, like something's going on here. We, if we're having a genuine relationship here and we have trust, we should be able to express when we're not totally satisfied with what's going on mm. and then you you're able to get through it you know there's this um community development life cycle i didn't develop this this is back when people were studying how communities were formed in real real life um but it starts there's four phases it's norming storm uh forming storming norming and performing and in that forming phase people are kind of quiet they're uncertain they're feeling it out they don't really understand the culture and really they haven't figured out their boundaries yet it's like the first time you put kids on a playground they just kind of like stare at each other they're not quite sure what all we can do but by the end of the school year they're like climbing the fences and doing everything they can but you have to start with this sort of uncertain phase they're trying to see like hey what's okay what's not okay you have your people who will kind of step out and push those boundaries and you have your people that will just kind of sit back and wait to see what happens but what will happen is is that as people start to push boundaries and as some people start to be more vocal and express their opinions and as everybody trying to tries to figure out the lay of the land, you can have this storming phase. And for some communities and in some seasons, that can be pretty hard, uh, whether it's a new community or whether, let's say you just did a launch, right? And you had 500 members and now you have a thousand members. You've just doubled the size of your community. That can send your community right back into this kind of forming and storming phase. But you can move through that phase pretty fast if you have clear cause and clear culture already established. 
because you just look for these realignment moments, right? Where you get to just sort of tap somebody on the shoulder and say, hey, I get your intentions are good, but like, we don't do that here. And here's why, Mm. you know, you just get to like bring people back into alignment, but it's totally natural for communities to move through that. And the storming phase, when we get through it, your community is more realigned and they are more committed to the cause. They're more committed to the culture. They appreciate that if you've had to be a bouncer and kick somebody out, they like are more committed to you because of it. They're like, thank you for protecting this community. This is important to me. And I'm even more in alignment with you, which is what leads us to that like norming phase of now we know our norms, we can function within those and then performing where we actually get to start collaborating. And it's like every school project you've ever done. Hmm. This is good. I'm getting lots of ideas for questions. Yeah. Um, Because this is super relevant because I've got multiple communities and I know a lot of people in my audience do as well. And I, I'm just trying to figure out some kind of order to ask these questions in. So... I'm really curious on... Well, let's just start with existing communities and then we'll move to starting a community. Yeah. So with an existing community, you know that you've got an issue if people basically aren't communicating or they're not being honest Mm -hmm. or there's just a lack of negative feedback. It sounds like it sounds like there should always be a healthy amount of neck, but even negative feedback is there's nothing actually wrong about it. No, you're, you're learning from your community and Mm. I, I so think it's a healthy it, sign, yeah, right? It's so healthy. Mm. I think a lot of people are terrified of that. Yeah, because, well, we all have an ego, right? And it's just like everything in the entrepreneurial journey, right? We don't it's we we don't want to disappoint people. We don't want people to not like us. But mm. if we're standing really strong for a cause, and if we have a really established culture our community will not be for everybody. And that's okay. Because if your community is for everybody, it's for nobody. I mean, look at every movement that has ever happened in human history. There were people that were on the side of the movement and there were people that were not on the side of the movement. Mm. Yeah, I think some people have this fear that like, this post, let's say someone did a negative post that, this could gain traction if I don't delete it now kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting because we had one of these happen just this week because, you know, the Black Friday deal we're doing is WeTube that's discounted and the members of WeTube were not happy about it, right? Yeah. And they expressed that, which I guess is a good sign, first of all, and then that thread kind of took off and... I definitely, I was, I had this moment, I'm remembering it clearly because it was just a few days ago. And I was like, do I delete this? Because more people could come in here, see this, and then they're going to join in on it. But then I was talking to my team about it and we're like, well, I, we get it. They have a valid point actually. So if we delete it, it's not going to fix anything really. Right. So instead we thought, well, let's just leave it. But now I need to do another post and address it. And talk about it and I need to make it right for them right and that's what I ended up doing and I left the negative one there but then some then it we totally got like won everyone back and then one guy even said this is why I'm a loyal customer because you listen and you make things right and this kind of stuff so that's what you would recommend like never delete the negative feedback because I guess if I did delete that and acted like nothing happened, then someone might not share again, right? Yeah. Well, and the thing for me is I never like to tell anybody specifics about how to run their community. So I have clients that they they don't allow any negative feedback in their community. But what we none. do... None. Why? About their Isn't program. that weird? Well, it is, but they have a very, very, very strong culture and a very, very focused cause. And a lot of my clients are life coach school clients. And so there people can have a tendency to not manage their mind well. And so if they have people really focused on this goal, let's say it's weight loss, for example, 
And then this negative post like takes off inside of the community. What they don't want is to distract the other 10,000 people in their community from that goal. So what Mm. I always recommend is that if you feel like for whatever reason you need to remove a post, you always open up another channel for that conversation to happen. So I was just messaging with a client last night. They um, had something happen in their community. There was somebody in their community that was posting an event or promoting an event. It wasn't this person's and it wasn't the client, but it's like this $3,000 retreat. And they're like, hey, let's let's all go to this retreat together. I'm going to start a separate Facebook group or a separate community and we'll will and this person genuinely just was like hey we're getting the community connected but what she doesn't see is um the potential that that has to splinter the community and cause issues because people now see this event as associated with the brand etc so the um community manager had already deleted the post and we just had a conversation where i said so just reach out to her and get on the phone with her and talk to her and that's genuinely i think so many issues that blow up in communities could be solved with a phone call, but mm. we just forget like, oh, I could just, I could just pick up the phone and talk to this person. But often what we do is we do this like back and forth on inside of our community or we do back and forth on email. But really when you get two humans on the phone and they're talking, you get to an understanding a lot faster. But you did the right thing in that you said, okay, I don't really see any issue with leaving this up. And they have a point and we need to make it right, which is where that leadership piece comes in. Like when we talk about um, trust, we talk about clarity and clarity comes from structure and leadership. When there's not clear leadership, people don't know who to trust. They, Mm. They are looking around to say, who's leading this community. And if it's not you, it'll be somebody else inevitably. But you showed up in leadership, in integrity and said, look, hey, this was a misstep. We didn't think through how this would impact you all. You brought it to our attention and now we're going to do something about it. And again, that's one of those realignment moments that really helps build trust. Yeah. So I guess the reason why those people that you were mentioning they kind of want to delete it for the same reason. They don't want it to spread. You know yeah. what I mean? But yeah, I've found I've had an interesting experience with this because when we started building school, we had the school community where people would share feedback. And at first it was just all like we're missing this thing's missing like a thousand different things, right? Yeah. And some people on my team were like, but if people I don't think we should have this because it just makes our product look bad. And then my argument was, it is bad. Like, that's what it is. We're not changing that if we just remove this, right? And I was like, yeah. my worst nightmare is not knowing what's missing or what's bad. Because then I, then I can't fix it. But mm-hmm. provided I know what it is, then I can fix it. And eventually there will be less and less and less. And eventually people will say they love it. And at that moment, you've really like won the community, right? Because everyone, you got everyone in there. You never deleted anything. You asked for criticism and you just went through it one by one until people had run out of things. And then they said, I love this. Yeah. Yeah. Although that took like three years. Yeah. So it takes time. But I think people are really afraid of that, though, that initially there's going to be criticism and then your community looks. It doesn't look good, but I guess. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? People think that every it should be amazing and everyone should be saying this is awesome from the first moment. But the way you get to that is by actually hearing all the stuff that needs to happen and then addressing it all. Yeah, I've. Oh, so many thoughts on this. Okay. So um, my first thought is, is this is generally human nature to think about the thing that we don't have and not all of the things that we do. And so it's no different with school. They probably had a lot of features that they loved and thought were amazing, but we always are looking for the things that we don't have in life and that we don't have in school. And especially when we're asking for feedback, they're like, oh, we need this, this, and this, this isn't working. 
So by nature, you're you're going to get more negative in that. But this, to me, is the shift that is happening with business, where you have old business, which was a bunch of smart people sat in a room. They spent a whole bunch of money, a whole bunch of time, and a whole, you know, bunch of investment and all of this to build some type of product, right? And then they had it perfect in their eyes and they put it out in the marketplace and they start selling it. And that is the product. They might do some market research, some focus groups, talk to a few people, but that's how products were developed. But we're not in that time anymore. We're in the community built product era where we don't have to have it all figured out. And that's the beauty of it. We can do the 20% version. And then as a community, we can build it together. And that's so cool about what you're doing with school is you have basically created this platform and said, look, here are the bones. This is what we have. We're going to build this thing together. No, you guys aren't going to be coding it, but we're going to listen. We're going to pay attention to what you want, what most of you want. And as long as it, it's in alignment with our core values as a company and who we want to serve with this platform, we're going to make that happen. And so what you get is a much better product. And not only do you get a much better product, but you get a product that has a loyal community because they have ownership of what you built. Like mm. they feel like they are a part of the school team and like they've helped build school, which takes them really fast. There's this like community member cycle where they go from just joining the community to actually engaging with the community, to sharing about the community, to lead, being a leader in the community. And you're able to speed that up because you are advocating for people to give feedback. You're listening to that feedback. You're making changes. And now they have a deeper established identity as a member of your community. They feel more ownership of it and then ultimately advocate for it better, which is what you want, right? The best marketing are people going out and talking about your product. And that's what you get when you have a community built product. Hmm. Yeah. I think it's just this thing that people have, like, it's like starting a YouTube channel. Everyone's going to see you've got zero views and zero subscribers. Yeah. So you don't look very successful. And that's probably the same thing with the community, right? Like they want it to be, to look impressive immediately. So they want to add a lot of people really fast. And then they want it to all be everyone saying how awesome the community is real fast, but it has to go through that. It has to go through the beta stage kind of like, and yeah. the bugs have to be fixed kind of like. Just, yeah. And, yeah. And I don't know that that stage ever ends. You know, I, I work with a lot of um, membership owners who have seven and eight figure memberships and we're working on retention strategies and, the first thing that we do is establish metrics. And the second thing that we do is a member survey because most of them have not surveyed their members in the longest time. And we're, we're kind of in the cycle where members ask for something or one member asks for something and we create for that member. And then you turn around and your program has like 50 different deliverables and like you don't even know how you got there you just kept creating you don't know what people are using you don't know what they're, what they're actually getting results from like what deliverables are actually helping them the most why are they not using it why are they leaving are they satisfied are they not so we dig into all of that and it's fascinating what we find like we just completed this with one client and they have all of these things that they've added, these fancy software tools. And if people do the basic like PDF meal plan and workout plans that they've been doing forever, that's what makes them their best customer. So we have to continually create that feedback loop with our customers. And you naturally have the ability to do that because you've created this community, but a lot of people don't. And so if you don't have that, definitely be serving your customers on the regular, getting feedback from them. Mm. So yeah, let's stay on the like existing communities. I want to get to like people starting one from scratch like after that. But so existing communities, you know, you've got a problem if people aren't sharing feedback mm -hmm. or being honest, or if they're just saying positive things. Um, 
how do you turn that around if it's already kind of gone bad? Yeah, if you can identify what caused that trust issue, um, it can be a number of things. Sometimes there was some storming in the community and because you were afraid or uncertain about how to respond, you just let it play out and waited until it died down. You didn't protect your community during that time, meaning you just kind of let conflict happen or you just kind of let this vocal person come in um, and things got crazy and chaotic in there for a while and you you just kind of watched it happen. You didn't really lead well through that. And then your community is now different afterwards. And you may be able to point back to that. For a lot of people, they can point back to 2020, <laughs> honestly, because there was a lot that happened inside of the communities. There was a lot of controversy that crept into a lot of business communities in 2020, and people just frankly didn't handle it well. And so you have some repairing to do, just like in a normal relationship, like in a marriage relationship. If you feel that disconnection, you have to invite in reconnection by be doing some repairing. And oftentimes that's just going to your community and saying, I ghosted you. I'm sorry. Mm. So right? you think that's one of the biggest causes of this is people, the leader disappears. Yeah. They, they either disappear or they s ignore things that they shouldn't be ignoring. Like they ignore negative feedback or they ignore conflict that's happening or they just stop showing up. Uh, mm. As entrepreneurs, I see this a lot. We get excited about something new. So we start this community and then we get bored. We're really easy to get bored. So um, we get bored. We move on to something else. We um, get overwhelmed by the community. There's lots of people that are amazing business owners and entrepreneurs, but they feel a heaviness about showing up for hundreds of or thousands of people on a regular basis. And so they don't realize it, but subconsciously it's draining their energy. And if that thing is draining their energy, then they stop doing it. They stop showing up. And so it's usually not a conscious decision to stop showing up fully for your community. Usually we do it in the name of system, like creating systems or scaling, right? So we're like, oh, my team can just do that. Or, oh, we're just going to schedule. Even now I, I just saw um, this new feature that was released that was like, okay, you can schedule in your group, you can schedule the same post to go out every week on the same day and time. And we'll just like automatically post it for you. It, Isn't that it, real life? Like, no, we do all of these things, like in the name of having more time freedom and at, like, it's it not a community. But if that was my, like every day at 9am on Wednesdays, Sam, you got a text from me that was like, Hey Sam, how are you? What are your wins for the week? <laughs> You'd be like, you I mean, maybe the first time I did it, you'd be like, oh, so cool. She she cares. That's awesome. S second week, you'd be like, I don't think I'm going to respond to this. Third week, I, I'm in your block list, right? You're just ignoring me at this point. And yet that's how we treat our communities because we want to create more systems. We want to be able to scale. But subconsciously, it's because that community doesn't light us up. And just circling all the way back to the beginning, when you have a clear cause that you're passionate about and when you have a really strong culture, your community is a place that lights you up. It should be a place that you're excited to be in and be engaged in those conversations. And if it's not, that's the fix. Like, how do you create the community that you're you're waking up excited to hop in on and see what conversations were happening while you were gone? Because so often as business owners, we build these communities, we just kind of let them become mediocre we stop showing up because it doesn't light us up. And then over time, people in our community stop showing up and we wonder why. And it's like, well, you didn't want to show up there. You weren't excited about being in your community. I have one client where we just did like a full, full redo of all their community guidelines of all of their like alignment around their culture for that very reason, because I had an honest conversation with her and she's like, Shanna, I don't want to be in my community. And I'm like, yeah, I want to go on to that yeah. point a little bit because, yeah, I'm, we're still like kind of focusing on existing communities and what repairing one that's broken. But it seems like this makes a lot of sense that this is the cause of most communities kind of becoming broken is the 
person that's responsible, the leader of the community gets burnt out Mm -hmm. and then stops showing up. Yeah. Yeah. And I can totally understand that because if you try to take on the, like, I think some people think that a community is, they've got to answer everything. Right. Um, And that isn't sustainable. I don't know how you can do that ongoing. Right. So what do you suggest there? Like, is that an unhealthy community if someone's running it like that? Is that even a community? I think it's oftentimes it is necessary in the beginning because you're modeling the kind of behavior that you want to see. So setting an example. Yeah, okay. setting an example. But um, I teach, so I, I train community managers as well to lead in communities like this and support business owners inside of their community. And one of the things that I teach them is my ARC response model. And it's this framework around thinking through how to respond to a post. Um, and I give them this framework because the, the most important part of it is the C and the ARC model, which is connect. And the goal of that is who else in this community can I connect them to? So my job is not to be the expert. My job is to connect them with somebody that can either support them or relate to them. So when you think about every response as like, I want to acknowledge what they just said. I want to reference a resource if I can inside of my training or you know, you might be referencing like, hey, that's that's on the scope. It's coming out in two weeks or whatever it might be. But then like, who could I connect them to? Oh, um, Tim asked a question like that last week. You guys must have a similar community. You guys should connect, right? Or somebody asked a question about like, I don't know, Instagram ads. And it's my community. I'm the business expert. I should answer that. Well, no, if there's somebody in your community that's an expert in Instagram ads, just tell them like, hey, Sally knows a lot about Instagram ads. Maybe she can help you. And what you've done there is you've started to give people permission to respond. So that's the first thing that I recommend is is making those connections by basically giving your people an invitation to be the one who answers the questions. And then the second thing is to create space for your community. Uh, a lot of times we we feel like, well, people are paying to be a part of this community or I'm the leader, so I need to be the one responding and it should never go more than 12 hours without a response or people are gonna feel left out. But what happens is, is once the leader responds or even the community manager responds, it takes a pretty bold person to then like follow up with a, a differing opinion about that, right? So let's say somebody asked a question about the future of community platforms inside of school and you immediately came in and you responded with like your thoughts around the future of community platforms. Uh, It's going to take a pretty strong person to come in and be like, I actually disagree with Sam. I actually think it's going to be this or it's going to be that, right? So we have to create space for our people to go first and then when they do, validate that. So I I really see people create the space. Sometimes they let people respond and then they come in and like put in whatever they were going to say without reading the comments. And I just, I always look for opportunities to recognize because that's one of the things around retention. Like one of the biggest elements of retention is recognition. Um, So if we can give people recognition in the littlest ways, like, hey, Tim, that response was amazing. Thank you so much for pointing him to that resource. Um, awesome. Like, great. What Tim said. Mm, that's it. funny like, because just whatever he said. I call that like public customer support system. It's yeah. like a customer support yeah. ticket where you email support yeah. at, except it's happening in public, right? Um, which is not really a community, but that's what I think. That's how I think most people run them. And I've definitely been guilty of that in the beginning. But what's interesting is that one that really sucks to do as the person because you feel this constant burden. Yeah. Every time your phone gets a notification, you just like cringe a little mm. inside. Or you just feel like you've just got to do it every day, all the time, and that it's you're burning out, right? Yeah. But the other thing is it kind of sucks for the members because it's not really it's not interactive for them. But I think the 
you know, it's funny what happened with me is I just got too busy that I couldn't do it. And then that's when the communities actually got better, Mm -hmm. which I found really interesting. And what ended up happening is some of the other people in the community had like, my shadow was kind of taken away from them so they could like shine. You know what I mean? And then they started to get more vocal and share what they were doing. And then they kind of became the celebrities. And then when I asked my community what they wanted more of, they were like, we want to hear more success stories of people that aren't you. Yeah. Which is funny. Well, because- and they probably feel like they can't relate to you because of your prior business success, right? You've had this journey of going from consulting.com to school. And in some ways, I'm sure for a lot of them, it feels a bit unrelatable, right? Mm. So they're able to relate to these other people more. But I, I want you to talk a little bit a little bit more about this because a lot of people that I talk to, that is the very thing that they fear is having people shine more than them, be seen as celebrities inside of their community. They, they feel like people are kind of mooching off what they've built. So talk, I mean, talk to me a little bit about why you see that as a benefit and not a problem. Well, I didn't do it by design, first of all. If it was, I think this is really hard when you're the in this expert industry, right? Where you're supposed to, where people are paying you to be the expert. You definitely feel like you should be the expert all the time, right? And when I was in that position, I left hardly any room for anyone to talk. And what is really interesting about it is that like really smart, talented people don't want to be in that kind of environment because it's not very collaborative and it's more like, it's more like idol worship than like community, right? So then I, I got too busy building school and everything to, to be able to be the expert in everything. So I couldn't. So I started to let other people come up and talk on like YouTube organic or YouTube ads or these different parts. And I noticed that the audience liked it more. And then naturally what started happening is more talented people started to join because they were like, I want to be a part of that kind of thing. Where I can contribute. So then they could contribute and then the audience liked it more. And then we started getting even better people. And I was like, holy shit, what have I been doing? (laughs) Because this way, like the, the talent level went up a lot and then they shared and then the audience liked it more. And then that attracted even more talent. And then I just got the, I had to shift though, from being the guru or like expert, whatever, to being like the facilitator. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, and I didn't do that by design. It was just an accident that turned out to be really good. So that's, I think it's hard when you're when you're you're known to be the expert. It's just mm-hmm. hard to let go of that control. Mm. But I think what you saw, and this is, it's sort of a a fascinating way to look at it. But we talked earlier about how do you know. If, if you have trust or really the question is really how do you know the health of your community right and i think the biggest way to know is what happens when you leave when you don't show up what happens does your community continue to thrive right because when you look at movements right if 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 the civil rights movement relied on martin luther king jr being in every room it never would have happened mm. but he was the one that became the figurehead if you will that said, this is where we're going. This is what we're doing. This is how we're going to get here. He just lit that torch, but then he was able to pass that on to other people that then carried that torch along. And whether that's a community manager, whether that is, you know, different leaders that rise up in your community, it all starts like from that base of having a really strong foundation in which your community can thrive. Because if you didn't already have structure, culture, purpose around that community it would have been a crap show when you came back right but it wasn't they were all people who understood the culture who understood the mission who were in alignment and they showed up Mm. yeah i think that's what 
now that I've experienced it, it's definitely better. Like mm. to have a community where it's all about the members and not you, and the members add the value, not just you. It's way more fun. It's way more collaborative, and it does attract people that are more talented that can contribute more and improve the value for everyone. I just wonder why people don't do that. Do you have any thoughts on why they... I mean, I shared mine, but do you have thoughts on this? On why people don't That's obviously those the more best. collaborative There's not many of those, I don't yeah. think. No, I, th I think it... I, I'm always like, it just so much of it goes back to ego and um, it's like ego and greed, right? I've built this. This is mine. These are my people. You're going to take them from me or whatever, because as business owners, we all come with our own stories, our own baggage. And many of us have been burned along the way, whether in business or in personal life. So we don't trust people. And again, going back to like, do you trust your own community? Mm. You know? Um, and I think we, we, we do a few things. One, we we're think we think we're a lot more important than we really are. Right. We're not as important. Um, we think we own way more than we own. So we created this community and we think we own it. We own the the rights to the community, the people, everything in there. And we're afraid about what giving up any of that control looks like. Control gives us this feeling of safety and security that a lot of people want to have. But we also forget that we can recover from literally anything. And in this world where people are so afraid now of like being canceled, like don't say the wrong thing, um, we built this fear, I think. So people want control so that they don't miss step or that a mistake doesn't happen or they don't, you know, lose business or whatever it might be or lose the positioning as the expert because they have this scarcity mindset like there's only so many pie slices to go around which isn't true right you just create more pies but they think there's just you know a limited amount mm. to go around there's a lim limited amount of thought leadership they want to have control because they're afraid of somebody saying something or misstepping but we can rebound from any of that like we can come back from so much i know like for you I mean, you had a very successful business and I know you made decisions to totally shift that and go into a totally new business. And I I think you could be a person that would say like, yeah, like there's no like left or right turn that we need to be afraid of because we're resilient. We can continue to create. And I, yeah, I think it just comes down to fear. Like we, we think we're ego and fear. We think we're more important than we really are. And we want control. We're afraid of what is going to happen. Mm. Yeah. I think for me, I just did it for so long. Like I've been coming up yeah. with content and running communities and courses now for like 10 years. And when you do something for a long enough time, the most important thing you care about is like cost of maintenance yeah right because because you've ex you you don't want to do anything that's really high maintenance because you know it's not going to last because you've yeah. lived through enough of these cycles and i you just everyone gets burnt out when it's the they have to provide everything yeah and i started to notice that the community could be used as the way to create the value instead of just it all coming from me and then, so that's when I had this idea that, you know, it would be more about the core, I mean, the community and the people than the content. And then I was listening to like Joe Rogan's podcast and I was fascinated in how that thing got so popular because it was like the biggest podcast in the world. And he always had someone else on. So he's effectively promoting everyone not him, mm -hmm. but somehow that got him to be number one. And he didn't, he tried to encourage everyone to start a podcast. In fact, most like, of these people's podcasts came from there. So he wasn't like, he didn't have this mindset like, no one else can make yeah. one. I'm the guy. Like, he brought everyone on and then got encouraged them. And that just helped him even more. 
and I was like, okay, there's there's something to this, and it was the it was the same kind of phenomenon that I observe with the community course thing. It's like if you can somehow get it to come from the people instead of from you, and then that's actually more enjoyable for everyone. It's more valuable, and you will go further as well. And it's easier to maintain because it's all about the people, right? And so that's why we're in here right yeah. now. Because as a content strategy, because I can't just make YouTube videos. This isn't really on the topic of community, but YouTubers, if you talk to any of them, they get burnt out. Mm -hmm. I'm sure TikTokers to anyone, you just get burnt out because you're constantly under the gun to like produce. Right. But if you bring in other people, then that's kind of that burden's taken off of you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You hit on something that like going back to that question of why do you, I think people, why have people not built these kinds of collaborative communities? I'm not going to soapbox on this, but you, um, you started to see it modeled. And that's the best way that we learn as humans is to see things modeled and then we imitate them. So if you haven't seen it modeled, right, if you haven't been a part of a community like that yourself, it's really hard to want to create it or to even know how to create it. So being a part of a community like that is essential. But um, just a, a side thing, again, that I won't soapbox on, I'm a huge believer in community in real life. Uh, my friends and family joke that I would be the first to like sign up for a communal living and like find a commune and like raise my family in a commune because I, I actually believe that oh, so many of the problems we see in the online space are actually rooted in the fact that we were created in community. We were created to live in community yet. Now we like drive into our castles. We shut our gates of our garage doors and we are siloed. And now even more than ever, we raise our families on our own. We don't have multi-generational family homes. After um, the pandemic, we isolated ourselves even more. So we have this like toxic culture of isolation and feeling like I can do and create and live this life on my own and I'm responsible for all of these things on my own. But we were actually meant to live in a way more communal way, in a way more collaborative way in our daily life. And if we lived that out more, we would understand the importance of community. We would understand the value of people contributing. Why do you think it's like that? Because I've, I've noticed that too. Community in the physical world is definitely degraded. 100%. Why? Well, one part is just generally you saw, uh, this is, I'm totally nerding out with you right now on this, but you saw a big shift in this as transportation became more accessible. So it used to be that families all stayed in the same place because it would be a lot to like pack up your horse and buggy and go, you know, or people couldn't afford vehicles or whatever it might be. And if you moved away from your family, it wasn't convenient for you to go back and visit them frequently. But now, you know, my my in-laws, they have a house in Minnesota. They have a house in Arizona. They're flying in to visit us. Like we're we're all over the country and yet we we can still make those visits. But what happens is that we miss out on that closer connection of having people. And then when you go and you move and living in Nashville, it's a very nomadic place, right? I'm born and raised there. They call us unicorns because most people are not from there. But you go and you try to establish community and build relationships, but where? How? Like, first off, everybody's busy, especially if you have kids. You've got your kids in like 50 different activities. You don't have time to do anything, right? Um, people have trust issues, so they don't want to go deeper into relationship because everything is so divisive right now. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't know that I can talk about like health choices for my family or can I talk about politics or, you know, everything is so divisive. So it's, it's really scary to go from surface to deep with people. And then just the general environment for community, we used to have gathering places in towns where like everybody would gather um, at like the town hall or the community, you know, meet and three diner or whatever it might be. There were more gathering places. 
Uh, even churches, for example, churches have always been a great place for people to build community. But now it's like, well, your office, well, it's all virtual now. <laughs> like, mm. So you move to a new town, you work virtually, you don't go to church, your kids are in school, but the parents aren't allowed to participate in school like they were before. So and everyone's busy. Everybody's busy. So nobody's like chilling, having cook cookouts in their neighborhood and inviting strangers over. It's just we try and live very differently and, and have been able to kind of create some of that. We've had to create family for ourselves because our family is not close to us. But yeah. And then it and then it just it plays out in the online space, I think, because we we don't get to practice community. We don't get to see community lived out. And then we're supposed to turn around and genuinely create that online. And mm. It's hard. We just aren't seeing it modeled. Yeah. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with the internet for some reason. Because, I, you know, the old, if you think of like old little towns, mm -hmm. like there was the church and the town hall and the main street, right? Mm -hmm. And everyone lived there. Everyone would probably work there. And even the police officers, they're policing their own neighborhood. Yeah. So they care more about it because it could be their kid or whatever. Mm. And everyone was just in this contained unit where they knew they were going to see everyone at church. They would go to the local town hall meeting and everyone there lived there. And that was where the taxes were spent and it was this good little atomic unit. But then it all kind of changed with globalization and, and all of this mm. other stuff. So then people went, they moved, they started working somewhere else. And then, you know, the cost of living goes up dramatically. So then a lot of the people that have to service the town, like the police yeah, don't live in the can't town. live there. Yeah. So they don't care as much. And then you just get a lot of renters, which, you know, is different again, because now they don't care as much. You've not established. And then people aren't going to church, so they're not seeing each other, and they're not even working at the same places. But what I think is happening, though, is you used to, and you can tell me what you think of this, I don't know if this is the right answer or whatever, but everyone used to be in a community based on their local town, mm -hmm. right? And you didn't have much of a choice in that. But now people on the internet are seeking community based on interest. Are you noticing this? Yeah. And so it's like they're yeah. the new churches in a way, like yeah. online communities that are interest based. Yeah. And that's, to me, I think the biggest gift and I think responsibility that we have, and I definitely feel a weight of as somebody who stewards community creators, is that we get to help people create community where they cannot find it in their local area. And I experienced that as in when I started my entrepreneurial journey back in 2012, so 10 years ago, it was super lonely for me. Like I was a Christian suburban mom who quit her well-paying corporate job to start my own business. I mean, like I had friends sent me down over margaritas and be like, okay, if you need money, we can help you. You're just working so hard. It just wasn't common. It took years before I found an entrepreneurial community and then an entrepreneurial community of women and then one of moms, right? And that's like the uncommon commonalities are ways to connect people. So when you're in a town, the commonality is that we all live in this town and we all experience this thing. We go to this church. We, you know, uh, all experience the tornado that went by three years ago, or we have these shared experiences because we are around each other. But what online communities have created for us is this ability to build communities around uncommon commonalities. And that can be a shared mission and vision, or it can be other things. Like I am a homeschooling mom who is also an entrepreneur. Mm. I, before, I would have not been able to find my people. But we have this beautiful gift of creating spaces online where people can feel seen, known, understood, and connected in a way that they never could before. 
But I think my my challenge to us as community creators is like, let's create that place and let's do it in this really authentic and beautiful way that like you've talked about is, is community led, but it doesn't have to stop here. Like this should be the the town hall, but the community members don't do everything in the town hall, right? They, they go off and they gather in other places, they get together in person. So when you're leading a community like that, you're traveling, like do meetups, right? Help your members facilitate, like find places where uh, they can meet up with people in your community because they live nearby. Um, Get them on Zoom calls and don't just like talk at them, like put them in breakout rooms and get Mm. them talking with each other. So I just think of, for example, like when somebody builds a school community, they should be thinking of this as the hub. Like this is the hub for everything that we do. This is where our content lives. This is where our community gathers. This is where you can find those connections. You can find people who have even more shared interests um, or live near you or whatever it might be. You can find those commonalities that you want to connect around or collaborations. But this is the hub that we all come back to you. But we like, we kind of like web out. You, We do Zoom calls and, you know, we do live events or gatherings or we do all this other stuff, but it always comes back to the hub. Mm. Yeah, I found this pretty interesting because when, you know, I'm from New Zealand and I had my friends like from school, right? Because we went to the same school, we lived near each other, we were the same age. But we didn't like the same stuff. So, you know, a lot of them, they like rugby, which is a sport in Mm. New Zealand. I hate rugby. But I just dealt with it. I just watched it anyway. Yeah. Um, But I never liked it at all. And then, you know, with the internet, I got really obsessed with the internet because I could find people like community that were interested in the obscure things I was interested in, like Counter-Strike or building a computer or rock climbing or car racing, things just things that, you know, not your everyday person would be into. And I found those communities online. That was in forums back then, so way before social media. And then we would actually meet up in real life. And then, you know, when I had... And I kind of had this experience of always loving what I was doing. Like if it was whatever the thing I was doing, I I wanted to love it and be very obsessed about it. And then I went and got a corporate job and I was not obsessed about that. And all the people I was hanging out with weren't either. And that's when I discovered like entrepreneurship again, online with an online community and they were approaching career with passion and like obsession. And I was like, okay, these are my people. And then I, that's why I ended, I actually did my first trip to America to hang out with them. And that's what inspired me to end up moving here. And so then I kind of found my, my people that are based on interests. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I guess a lot of people, do you think a lot of people are going through this kind of journey? Yeah. And And I think they're all going to find different ways to it. Like you mentioned climbing. There's a, there's a company in Nashville called climb Nashville and they have rock climbing locations, right? Well, it could just be a place where you go, you pay your, you know, fee and you rock climb. It's a whole community. Those ones are easy because there's a place. Whenever there was a place, it happened just so easy. Yeah. So I guess the hard ones is when there's not a place. Right. So this, this is what we get to do right? Building a school community is building that place Mm. where those people get to meet and they get to gather. Because when you think about that place, like climb Nashville, they go and you're going to make connections there. And by default, people are going to meet other climbers and et cetera, but they actually are facilitating that they're facilitating going on climbs They're you know, they've got like merch and stuff that like makes you be able to easily identify because they all got the bumper stickers on their cars or whatever it might be. They naturally, a community started to form and then they just threw gasoline on the fire, right? They facilitated that even more. And I think that's, that's part of the hard part about building an online community for the first time is you don't 
want to have to wait for that like momentum to build. You want it to be this thriving community overnight. And it it is it is like a living and breathing organism and it takes time for it to grow. And what's really important is that you start with the people that are really in alignment with what you're trying to build. And you could probably speak to this because, I mean, in the transition from consulting.com to school, you probably had to think through this. But if you if you don't start with people that are closely aligned with the mission and vision of what you're trying to do, it's going to get skewed really fast because as things multiply, it's like the game of telephone, right? By the time it grows to the 10th power or whatever, it's turned into something completely different because your original people were all kind of pointing in different directions. So if that close-knit community, those founders, those founding members are really aligned with the culture you want to create and the cause and you involve them and it's really collaborative and they know they're building that with you, then it can multiply so much faster and it can multiply in alignment with what you're looking to build. But so many people, they don't want to wait through those early days or years even of having a smaller community that's trying to build momentum or they want to like lay out a game plan today of what their community is going to look like five years from now but a community that is community led is not something that you can game plan out right you can't say five years from now, this is what this community is going to look like and be about. Just like you couldn't have gone and put a full feature set, like 10 years from now, this is all the features that school.com is going to have because you don't know Mm. yet the needs of your community. You don't know what's going to happen, what your community is going to go through. And that that's the part that, that is uncomfortable for people when they're starting online communities. But, but it's a, it's an amazing opportunity and everybody has it. Everybody has a chance without having to go and buy a building and create a business around it to start a community. You can go online, create a forum, find a couple of people that are either in alignment with mission and vision, um, on a similar journey because they have a similar goal or they have an uncommon commonality like rugby hating New Zealanders or whatever, right? Like you can... You can find those people and create that community and just facilitate that and see what happens. And next thing you know, you've created this like safe space on the internet for sometimes for people that have never experienced that kind of connection before. Mm. Yeah, there's lots of stuff I want to get into. Definitely how to start because a lot of people are probably in that category. Yeah. But I'm just thinking on the topic of existing communities, we went into like safety and how to restore that. Well, what other, before we kind of leave existing communities and how to make them better. So they've got to have like a, they've got to have a clear goal and everyone's got to be in alignment. There's got to be shared values. How do you actually communicate those and declare them to everyone like tactically yeah Yeah. um so going back to those realignment moments when some sometimes i sometimes i think we all believe we have to have our culture figured out before we start the community and chances are you don't you may have some general things but when somebody steps outside of your culture even if you don't have it clearly defined and you have that feeling that like there's something about this that's not right i don't like this i don't want this happening that's when you're like okay realignment moment we're bringing people back in and now we've established a new guideline within our community and i really encourage people to have beliefs behaviors and boundaries what do people like us believe what do people like us do and what do we not do or not allow, right? So beliefs, behaviors, and boundaries. And it's probably a short list to start, but you've got a few of them because we as humans, we just naturally have those things in our life. But over time, as you start to interact with your community, you'll start to notice the things that just 
don't feel right or feel out of alignment. And that list will continue to grow as you move your community back in alignment. But really basically like having community guidelines that people agree to when they join your community. And if you ever do have to realign people, it's really nice to be able to reference those guidelines and say, hey, just referring you back to this, um, you know, this just isn't something that we do. And then the beautiful part about having those established guidelines is, you know, structured as they seem is it almost is like a third party. So if you're a business owner who doesn't like correcting people in your community, all you have to do is say, Hey, um, I just wanted to reference the guidelines guideline number three. And this is being guidelines like beliefs, behaviors. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just trying to get things real tactical for some people. Yeah. Listen, even me, I'm like, what am I going to do when I leave this room? Right, like community So rules. just write down three things. Well, yeah, write down beliefs, beha- your beliefs, behaviors, and boundaries, and then create rules around those. Like, we... But it would be better if, like, I'm just thinking from school, because we can make school do anything. What yeah. if it just had these that you could answer? E- exactly, yeah. What, mm. are, what are our beliefs? You know, what are the kinds of behavior we want to see? What are the boundaries that we have, right? And it, wait, here's what you're saying. It's better than just saying rules because I swear no one looks oh, at rules. I know. It's rules. So, it's we have a so rules hard. feature and it's kind of sucks to be right. honest. What, yeah. what you're saying is like, this is, this. this is, yeah, this mm. is who we are and what we stand for, why we're here. This is how we act when we're together. And this is what we're not okay with. Like, this Mm. is where we draw the line. And if we're clear on those things, right, then we've created an environment that allows us to to all know where everybody stands. We've created structure. We've created safety. If people fall outside of that, that's when trust gets broken, right? Because we have that integrity piece. Um, yeah, and, and we put everybody on the same page. So then what happens is the more you're able to communicate those things, the more your community will, I don't want to say self-police, but your community members will be like, hey, man, that's not cool. Mm. You, you'll find yourself less and less having to align people around those guidelines or rules, if you will, when you've made them abundantly clear because everybody's bought into them from the beginning. You're going to have natural leaders that come up in your community especially the more they contribute right so then they are going to start correcting community leaders and you've modeled for them hopefully what that looks like it's not a like shaming of anybody it's just like a hey just wanted to remind you of this you know so if you wouldn't mind editing or removing your post that'd be awesome would you share any goal like shared goal yeah so that goes um so that beliefs, behaviors, and boundaries is under culture. And the first piece is cause. Um, and cause, cause is three things. It's purpose, path, and progress. But basically cause is having a really clear purpose. And then ultimately we want to give them the path to accomplishing that purpose and help them make progress. Now that all especially is true inside of our paid communities. We need people to be getting results, right? There's three things that help people retain relationships, results, and recognition. Like those are the three keys to retention right there. It's it's not as complicated as everybody thinks it is. It's relationships, results, and recognition. And if we can find ways to do and achieve those three things for our community, they're never going to leave, which is why I love like I, in school, you guys have that gamification piece so that people are getting like points for contributing in the community. Um, that's awesome because that right there is built in recognition for them. So we've got that, we've got the relationship piece and now it's a matter of the results piece. And part of helping people get results is creating a culture and an environment in which they feel safe to ask questions when they're stuck. Right. But yeah, it, it, that, that whole piece of like, why are we here? You know, what do we believe to be true about us or our industry or whatever it might be? It's kind of different depending on the business. How do we act in this space? And then what are what are our boundaries? Like, what are we not okay with? Hmm. So I think retention, which is relationships, results, recognition, you wouldn't really share that to the 
Because that's more of a retention strategy for the operator or the owner, yeah, right? right but for the business owner. These two sound culture and cause. I mean, they go in the reverse order, yeah. cause, culture. These sound like things you would want to make. Super clear. Yeah. yeah. So wouldn't that be better than having like rules? Yeah. Because that's really what everyone should define. If, if it's an existing community or it's new, you should define these three things. Yeah. And the, the yeah. cool part is for you and anybody else who already has an established community is you may have an idea of what those things are, but when you ask your community, they may have perceived boundaries and perceived beha behaviors that you're not aware of because it's so obvious to you. You know, we were talking about this before we turned on the mics about like, there's things that, that you do there's things that we do that are so obvious to us that we don't even realize that we're doing them or thinking them, but our community recognizes those in us or in that culture. So you have the ability to actually go to your community and say, Hey, here's what I think our beliefs are. Here's what mm. I think our behaviors are. And here's what I think our boundaries are. What would you add? What would you change? Right. Hmm. I think there's a lot to these basic things because some people have honestly come to me and they're like, I have a community, but no one's using it. Yeah. And I'm like, well, well, I'll give you a specific example. I just won't say the name of the guy, but it's a tax community. And there's like a few hundred people in there. No one's doing anything. Mm -hmm. And he's like, how do I get people to, and I'm like, well, what is this community for? And yeah. he's no, he doesn't know. Right. So then I'm like, Somebody well, told me I people, needed to have a community. That's how funny. did the people know what to do? Have yeah. you seen a lot of these? Oh, yeah. A lot of, a lot of people create communities because they feel like they should. Um, but a community platform, and I will just say this, I, I always like to distinguish between the, a community and a community platform because in this online space, we kind of see them as synonymous and they're not the community platform is just a facilitation tool to establish a community that should have legs that extend beyond the community platform itself right so we have to get really clear about what is the purpose of the community right and how does the community platform support that so we have a community to help tax people collaborate so that they can um uh, have a shared knowledge base around new tax codes so that they can better serve their clients and so that they can learn better tax management systems and system and idea share, whatever it might be. So that's why you have the community. Now we know the purpose of the community and how it serves the people in our program. What tools and platforms do we need to facilitate that kind mm. of purpose, right? okay, we want to have a, a shared space for people to talk and ask questions. Okay, so we're going to have a school community platform. That's going to be that shared space. Well, we'd also like for them to be able to connect um, and like decompress together or whatever it might be. Okay, so maybe we do Zoom calls or whatever. Maybe we do in-person stuff. You have all of these different tools that you can use to facilitate that bigger community, but people just don't get really clear on what it is and those that do often don't tell people. So really deciding strategically the purpose of that community platform, how you're going to use it, and then communicating that purpose, but actually driving people to it. Attention is the hardest thing for us to get. So if we are not telling people to come back to that platform and giving them a clear reason to do it, they're not going to do it, right? We only repeat things that give us results that we like. So if we come to a community platform and we post and we never get a response, we never feel connected, we never get engaged, we're going to stop showing up because we're not getting the result that we want. But if every time we show up in a community platform, there's something new, there's some other bit of wisdom that we missed, or there's some connection that we're making, we're going to keep showing up over and over again because we're being rewarded for doing so. So we've got to think about the trigger and the reward, which the basics of habit building, what's the trigger to get them into the community? And we as the business owner need to create that. And then what's the reward once they get there? And if we can just continually loop people through that trigger, reward, trigger, reward, then we're building the habit of coming to the community. 
but we just get this philosophy of like if we build it they will come and it just doesn't work that way hmm. it sounds like this is really important to define even for existing communities even if they're good yeah um and for a community before it starts because yeah, I've also noticed that a lot of people just get a lot of random different people in. And then from that point, it's quite hard to fix that one, right? Because no one knows why they're there. So you get all of these random people in there. Have you seen this one happen? Oh, I've, I've, where I see this happen the most. Is there any the most, saving that one? Uh, <laughs> there, it, you're basically starting over on the same platform, right? So you can you can revive any community. You just have to basically act like you're starting from scratch. But where I see that happen the most is when people have established communities and then community members are like, well, let's go start our own like sub community. And they like start a random sub community, but there's no real like vision for that community or purpose. And business owners would often be afraid because, oh gosh, there's this subgroup that's kind of started. I'm like, I mean, is that person committing every day to growing that community, that subgroup off of your community? No, they're not. So it might go for a couple months, but then it ultimately fizzles out because there's no clear leadership. There's no clear purpose for the community. There's no like constant driving people and communicating about the community. Yeah, that's why, I, I mean, just going back to those four pillars of my framework, if you look at cause, culture, communication, and connection, those four things are essential to keep a community thriving. Um, you can have a community that is missing one of those, but it ultimately is is going to fizzle out in the end. Because, what was the other yeah. one you said? You said cause, culture, retention, and... It's, well, it's cause, culture, communication, and connection are the four pillars that you need. Got it. So I think I'm missing like communication what's yeah. that one communication is um three different types of communication so um the first one is the most obvious one that we all do which is outgoing communication like me to you right um the second one is incoming which is how am i listening to my community what is their channel of communication with me and then the third is internal, which is the conversations that are happening among my community members and how am I facilitating those? And I have people look at and audit all of those different platforms because, you know, people have like their, their support platforms, their direct messages, their community platforms. They have all of these different ways that people can communicate with them. They have maybe email, their social channels, their community platform that they're communicating to, but they don't actually know what's going on in all of those different channels. And it's really important to me that the experience that people have with the business or the brand is consistent across any platform where they interact with us. So we've got to have a handle on all of those different ways we're communicating with them, they're communicating with us, and making sure that we have that open channel. Like we talked about earlier, it's so important to be able to get feedback and hear from our community and then that third one of how are we actually facilitating conversation and engagement among our members, that's where it goes from being, like you said, just like a public support platform to an actual community. Mm. So we've got, this is good. So I've got cause, culture, communication, and... Connection is the last one. And there's three parts to that? Three parts to that, yeah. What are they? Safety, which we've already talked about. Yep. Yeah space and this is what we were just talking about around like not you, answering you, immediately kind well of no um no it's um the different spaces we're going to create to facilitate connection mm. like so i would so, tell somebody okay your space your primary space is your school community platform that's your primary space but you may also have a space or a container that is a live event you may also have a space that's like coaching calls on Zoom or whatever it might be. So it's like the different spaces and how do we optimize those for connection? And then the third one is scale. And this one's really important because when you have a smaller community, you have a huge advantage because you can build relationships and get to know those people really well. 
and you can have conversations with all of them and you can build connections super easy. But how do you scale that as your community grows, right? That's one of the hardest things that happens when, you know, I, I have clients that have 14,000 members in a paid community that started years ago with her just having like a meetup group. How does she keep people feeling connected to her and not feeling like a number inside of that community of 14,000. And we've done a lot of work and she's done a lot of work to create that. But the biggest challenge that we run into in business is that as we scale, we lean more and more on automation. Mm. And although automation is really wonderful, automation can lead to alienation of our community. And so I really encourage people in scale automate to create space for your people automate things so that you can do more high touch or seemingly high touch activities because you just have to be so cautious of that right like we just automate ourselves into a place of alienation is kind of what we talked about where people lose trust in communities and community leaders because they get in this space of like i gotta scale i gotta systematize i gotta automate and they like lose the human connection they alienate their people so how do you scale that community while creating automations, but realizing the purpose of automation is so that you can do the the unscalable activities, right? Got it. This makes a lot of scenes. Yeah. And I mean, that is my framework that I use to teach inside of my programs and everything, but like that, that just comes from researching communities and humans. Like I've read books about how small groups form at churches and um, books about like, you know, uh, gangs and cults. I, I'm fascinated. I listen to, to podcasts about cults to learn about how they form. I mean, when you just, when you look at um, the good and the bad of community building and movements, you see common themes in all of them. And so how do we take that, learn from not just, you know, the last 20 years of what has been, well, gosh, not even the last 15 years of what has been building communities online. How do we take centuries of information around how communities have been built over hundreds or thousands of years and apply that to how we're building communities online. And that's what that framework is really attempting to do. Hmm. I think people are really bad at this. <laughs> yeah. I think it must be partly to do with the internet starting off as just like a content creation platform, right? Even like if you're on YouTube, you basically just isolate and make videos. Yeah. And that's how you get successful. Same with blogging. You actually shut it out to like focus and then you just produce and then you grow an audience. And that's how that model works. But the community one is totally different. And people, I think, is trying to apply the same thing to it. Yeah. Mm. Well, and how do you shift if you have been that content creator, right, that's built an audience? How do you shift that audience from an audience to a community? Like people talk a lot about Mr. Beast, right? It's been really big, really big YouTuber, maybe the biggest out there. But what he has done well is he shifted from like audience to community mindset, community mentality. Mm. Yeah, I think he's always had a bit of a community mentality. Like he makes videos with other people. He involves his audience in his videos. Yeah. He collaborates a lot with other creators and he has like a team and he does community work. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, like you were saying with Joe Rogan. Yeah. Right? It's a the lot best of, creators yeah. have figured out how to use community in collaboration, I found. Yeah. And mm. Mr. Beast, I think he even has like a a restaurant now or something. So he he is even now has physical spaces where mm. people in his community are able to gather. Yeah. No, I've noticed that happen more and more. Have you heard of this company? Is it like Chief? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Crazy story. Um, I trained a community manager for another program and the founders are, are going their separate ways. 
that community manager just became the community manager for chief. And I was on the airplane on the way here talking to somebody who's sitting next to me. She happens to be on the board for a subscription business, an app business in the athletic space. And she said the same thing to me. She's like, have you ever heard of the company called Chief? Mm. So it's fascinating. That has been in my world. That company has been in my world for the last two weeks. But yeah, they they bring together women who are in C-suite positions and create, which pay attention to what they're doing. Because one of my predictions for 2023 is that people are going to want deeper connection in communities. They're starting to people are starting to join online communities and then get burnt out just like creators of those communities are getting burnt out. People are wanting to find their people within your people. They're wanting to find their smaller group. And that's what chief has done really well is they actually put you in small cohorts. And there's physical space. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I've joined some things similar to that. They don't have physical space, but I mean, the two things that have stood out to me, if I'm looking at joining a community at the moment is strictness of entry criteria because I want to hang out with other people where I don't feel like I'm like um giving more than receiving kind of thing you know Mm -hmm. what I mean I want to learn something and I want to be with people that like where where it's symbiotic basically Mm -hmm. um and where I can learn something and then the other one is I don't want to do anything online because I just, I do so much stuff online. Yeah. So I'm like, are there physical meetups? And do people here in this group like like to meet up? So I've joined a few of those recently. So I think, and Chief does exactly the same thing. They've got strict entry criteria. Like you have to be interviewed. There's certain bar you've got to meet. Yeah. And then they've got physical meeting space, which kind of says the members want to meet up. Yeah. And I think mm. this is... um it's fascinating because I'm starting a peer mastermind this coming year. And the criteria for me was it starts with an in-person event. You ha- like in-person is required. What we do online in between is just to continue the conversations from the in-person. But the in-person piece is required, whereas I think a lot of people in the online space, everything has been online and then the in-person is an add-on. Mm. But what you're seeing, like what you're talking about and uh, what we're seeing with Chief and there's other companies that are doing it as well, we're actually going back to starting with in-person community and then leveraging the online space to support the activities and conversations that are happening in person. And it's not uncommon. Culture ebbs and flows like this all the time. We kind of are constantly on a pendulum of being out of balance. Right. Everything is online. Nothing is in person. And then people are like, hey, that was probably a bad idea. We like human connection. And then, you know, people kind of get burnt out. They start leaving social media. And I'd, I'm kind of curious if we'll ever really find this beautiful balance where people will have healthy boundaries around their online community space um, and still be in person. You know, I talk a lot on my podcast about I want people to find in-person communities. I want them to get involved in their local communities. Even if it they can't find fellow entrepreneurs, like you can find people with common interests because it's mental health is so important. And as entrepreneurs, I think we isolate ourselves so often. We don't build local in-person communities. And there's only so much, um, there's only so much connection that can happen online. You need, you like need human flesh to flesh interaction. And when we don't have that, I think it impacts our men- mental. I know it impacts our mental health. So if we can find that balance of having some smaller in-person communities that we go deep with, that are our inner circle, that have our most trust, um, I think that's incredibly valuable. And then we also have online communities where we can um, serve. They serve different purposes, right? We we get value. We build connections there. And some of those connections we'll take into that more intimate in-person community. And, and some of them we won't. But I've built um, some of my best relationships. My best business friend, Laura, I was speaking on stage in an event 
gosh, it must have been four years ago because my four-year-old was a baby. And she went up to my husband afterwards and like, I think I need to be friends with your wife. And I love that kind of person that just boldly says that. And a few weeks later, I was like, hey, if we're doing this, we voxered for a couple weeks. And I was like, hey, I'm flying my family up. So me and my family flew up, stayed with this practical stranger and her family. And we've been super close ever since. We try and get together at least once a year, if not a couple times a year. And we we talk on Voxer pretty much every single day. And that to me is like, if we can use the online space to find those people that we want to go deeper with, but remember that, that we can still have those more intimate communities, but those online communities, right? They are a big part of helping us find those people. And they also serve other purposes for us as well. So I think there's a balance between the two. And we've kind of been, we we skewed, especially during the pandemic, really heavy in the online space. And I think we're all seeing the world suffer because of it. Mm. Yeah, there's like, there's um, kind of like different clusters I've noticed. Because I just think of when I went to university or college, it's pretty big, but you're in a year, right? And then you're in a major and a business school or whatever. But then there's just the people that happen to be in the same classes as you. And then there's the people that sit next to you for whatever reason. And those become like your friends, which is usually like five. Mm -hmm. But then your friends are like kind of part of this group that go to parties together and things like that. And you're part of this wider thing that sometimes you see at different parties. Do you know what I mean? And that's how it all kind of comes together. Mm. My husband and I have joked about, um, you know, as education and college education, everything after high school goes more online. We think a lot of the universe, like campus universities that we see, well, they'll start to shut down. They just won't be anymore because people will realize that you can get uh, speed of learning online, right? So we've joked and said, we're going to start buying dorms and turning them into entrepreneurial, like communal living communities where you get a bunch of entrepreneurs living together, like working together in this shared space, because there's nothing like that environment you get in college where you're spending all of that time together in share, like just pure shared space. Like you were talking about, the more you see somebody the more likely you are to build connection with them. And college is the perfect environment for that. And it builds shared experience and shared experience is a great way to create connection as well. So um, so imagine if you like people who now are not going to college, but they could still really benefit from that kind of community experience that you get in college, how do you create like a four year community experience for entrepreneurs coming out of high school that don't wanna take the college path, but also do not wanna just like go and buy a house and start a family, how do you create that kind of space for those people, for them to get the social and emotional learning that happens in those four years of living in close proximity with other people um, without actually having to go to college. So, yeah, cause I, there's something that happens just by being in proximity, but it's that depth of community that you get when it's just, like you said, you, you're at the same college, you're in the same major, you're in the same class, and then you sit next to each other. How do we create a similar experience for people inside of our online communities? Mm. Yeah, that's what I noticed. College definitely beats the internet in terms of like friendship and community, 100%. And fun. Yeah. Because college is mostly people, it's fun more than it is like educational. But it, the content isn't that good. I think that's where the internet comes in. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's um this book called the, oh, I want to call it the One World Schoolhouse. I think it's the One Room one world schoolhouse i can't remember by salman khan he's the founder of khan academy which is a free online learning system my husband is a former teacher and he was really loved this concept that he teaches in this book where he basically says we have it backwards we bring children together to hear a lecture from somebody where they do not talk and then we send them home to do the work 
and figure it out, right? And then the parents end up carrying the burden of being the partner that helps them figure that out. What if they watched a lecture at home and then they came into the space and that's where collaboration happened. That's where they worked it out together. And so he was trying to reverse this idea of the classroom and basically say like, hey, let's have online lectures. And he does through Khan Academy. And then let's leverage the time when we're in community to actually collaborate. And I like applying that to the online space as well, because I think we all fall victim to this because we were all raised in the same school system, essentially. When we have Zoom calls, we tell people to come and show up and then we talk at them for 45 minutes, right? If we are bringing people together in a room, it needs to be for them to take advantage of the collaborative minds of all of the people in the room, or you should have just told them to watch a video. So how do we even take that concept and bring it online where if I'm going to gather people at a certain time, a certain place online, I'm going to leverage all of the minds in the room or all of the opportunities for connection, you know? Um, Mm. So like there's so much that we can learn for spaces outside of, of the online world. Yeah, that's what I started to do after a long period of time. The problem, I think, with it is that it's scary because you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So like, I started doing that with my events, my mastermind events. I just got everyone to come to the room. Like, I knew we were all doing the same thing. We all have info businesses mm-hmm. and we're all pretty successful. And I knew we'd be in the same room for three days and I'm sure we've got plenty of problems, right? So... I was just had confidence that we could figure it out and there was no agenda and then it just got figured out and the content that came out of that was like people love it more than if I just came up with a keynote series yeah um and that's kind of what you're talking about right you just bring the people together you've got to have like alignment which is kind of your first two things you talk about but then you've just got to let it kind of happen Instead of trying to premeditate it all and then create content and then just lecture everyone. Yeah, I think a lot of that is we have overly structured the mastermind environment. And that is part of, and I was talking to a couple of gals about this peer mastermind that I'm starting. We we talked about what the in-person gatherings would look like. And I was like, the complete opposite of what you're used to. We're going to structure in white space. We're going to structure in time for you to be filled um, emotionally, spiritually, all of these things that as somebody running a, a business, you don't do. Like most of us don't have white space. We don't have time where we take care of ourselves. So we're going to structure that in. And then we're just going to leave a lot of white space for conversation. Because here's what I know. If I get a bunch of smart people in a room together who are all on a similar journey of creating a business and we all have a similar heart, meaning we all are there to serve first instead of receive, every single person is gonna leave with feeling like they have been served and with a problem solved, right? I don't have to facilitate that. I don't have to say, okay, you get 15 minutes, you get 15 minutes, you get 15 minutes. And I know that's that, weird. Whenever I, I see those structures, yeah, I'm, like, I'm like, I don't know it, what's going on I've, there. I've seen it work for for certain situations where you have limited time and you've got a lot of people and you need to make sure you know everybody gets a voice. But but where the where the best stuff happens and where that intimacy comes is when we just leave space for things to happen. So we're all staying in an Airbnb together every time because I think and I know from being part of masterminds myself that the best conversations happen when the structured part ends and dinner starts, right? When we sit together at dinner or we, you know, go up to the patio or the bar afterwards or a small group of us go into somebody's hotel room and start chatting till one in the morning, like that's where my journal is full. Mm. That's where I'm like, oh, I finally got clarity. Because so often when we do these hot seats, that most masterminds will do like these hot seat kind of thing. I don't even really know the question I'm asking. I think I know, but what I need is a back and forth conversation with people who get me, who can get to the real question behind the question, because the question I'm asking isn't the one I should really be asking. But when we have like this structured time, right, we we don't we don't create space for that back and forth. So um, 
uh, there's, oh gosh, there's a company right now and I'm forgetting their name, but they, they teach this concept of uh, creating this kind of connection and facilitation in virtual spaces. And how do we, how do we create safety? It's kind of funny because a friend was like, oh, you have to attend this because they talk about a lot of the same stuff that you talk about. And I attended and it was very much kind of this back and forth that I teach a lot of my clients where we have we have um, an initial kind of like stage setting of the call. We have some initial sharing that starts to get people comfortable, right? And then eventually we get to this where it's like, we we have a, a little bit of teaching, a call to action, and you send them off to like do it and share about it and then come back together and share and then a little bit of teaching and a call to action. And then it's like, do the thing, go share, come back. So it's, it's constant engagement. It keeps people's attention. They're actually doing the work on the call. So they're making progress, which gives them results, which, you know, they're more likely to join your program or stay in your program if they're getting results. But in the midst of that, they're getting human connection, right? And that connection makes them sticky. It's the same reason that churches, they know, right? Well, I wouldn't say all churches know, but there are books that teach churches about how to get more members, get people involved more. And they talk about getting them to meet as many people as possible on their first Sunday. Because the more connections you have, the more deep you are in connections, the more likely you are to stay, mm. right? And then the next level of that is how deep am I going with those connections? Because there's mm. only so long that I'm okay with it all being surface, right? I want to I want to start getting some, some depth uh, to that relationship over time. But. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Do you have any any good ways of getting the members of a community to develop connections with each other? Yeah, so a lot of it goes back to what we were talking about earlier around that ARC response model where we're actually like pointing people to each other. So we're saying, oh, Sally just asked a question like this last week and tagging Sally in the community and making that connection. A lot of people are using directories to do that and asking questions in directories that relate around common interests outside of just like, hey, what's your LinkedIn profile? What's your Instagram handle? Um, you know, what are your hobbies? What do you like to do? What's the last book that you read? There's a lot that you can tell about a person in that way. But it kind of goes back to those calls that we were talking about. One of the easiest ways to create connection is by giving people space to connect. And I have a friend who does virtual speed dating for her community. Like it's a business building community, but she wants them to have connection. So they get on Zoom and she sends them into breakouts and pairs. And then like they have like 15 minutes to connect and then she brings them all back in. She sends them back out. And by the end of an hour, you've met at least three to four people and had a chance to talk one on one with them. And then she encourages them to continue that. You know, other people do informal or formal accountability groups to help people get connected. But it's really simple if we find ways for people to discover uncommon commonalities. So if you ask a question like, who here um, has a uh, an online program that serves um, teachers, right? All those people are going to comment. They're going to find each other. Who here has this? So they start to find each other in those comments. So they're finding those uncommon commonalities. And then the other way is through shared experience. So this is where... Um, in person can make a really big difference because in person naturally creates shared experience. But you can also do this by, let's say, for example, um, there's something going on in your local community and you want to contribute to that cause or whatever it might be. It'd be really easy to just be like, hey, we're going to raise money for this whatever cause that I think is really important. But if you're like, hey, um, we really want to support this fire station down the road for me that burned down or whatever it might be. Hey, here's the address. My goal is to send a hundred letters to this fire station in support of them. Totally random. But as a shared goal, we're having a shared experience around a common cause. So now we've like created this cause. We've, we set a goal for it. 
and we're going to have a shared experience because we're going to work towards that goal together. And I'm going to be communicating with you and you're communicating with each other what we're doing towards that shared goal. And now we're all going to remember when we hit that goal. We're all going to remember that shared experience. So there's lots of ways to do it and facilitate it. It's just like if you think about it like hosting a party, right? You walk in, you're the party host. You don't talk to that person the whole time. You can't talk to that person the whole time. You know enough about them to go, oh, you need to meet Alice. Come over here. You need to meet Alice. And then when you're done talking to Alice, if you haven't met Janice yet, Janice has a four-year-old too, or Janice's son plays soccer too. Like you guys should meet. So it's just putting yourself in that party host mentality of like, how many connections can I make? Because the more connections you make, the more comfortable people feel, the deeper they go in your community. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. It just, it's so natural when it's in real life. Yeah. Because you just, you're in a space and you just somehow like bump into people and form little groups and then you just meet people, right? Yeah. But that doesn't seem to happen online. You just, you have to, that's why I think people have a lot of difficulty with yeah. it. Yeah. It's more structured facilitation. Like you actually mm. have to think about how am I going to give people space to connect and opportunities and realize that not everybody wants to. And mm. I think that's a big part of it is you will have people at all levels. So you'll have people who are just engaging with your content and they all, they're they never going to engage with your community. And that's okay because that's how they want to use your community, right? You'll, you'll have people who are, you know, from that spectrum to just like, hey, I pop in every now and then when I have a need and I just look at your content and I get it and I'm good. And then you'll have people all the way on the spectrum of like, I show up every day because these are my people. The, this is my only community that I, I have and I want to be a leader. If they hired me tomorrow, I would quit my job and say yes, right? We have the spectrum. And I think um, understanding that people interact differently, but creating opportunity and encouraging them to interact at the highest level and knowing that they all won't. Mm. Yeah. Got it. What about starting a community from scratch? Like, I know a lot of people want to do that mm -hmm. and they want it to be successful, right? What would you tell people? What advice do you even have, like, particular advice you'd give to someone if they're thinking of starting a community from scratch? I think the biggest thing is just going back to those principles, getting really, really clear on the purpose. Like, mm -hmm. what's the so cause? So defining like yeah. the the purpose, path, progress, mm -hmm. and then beliefs, behaviors, boundaries. Are yeah. you going to know all of those though right away? No, you're not, and you, you're you're going to have to just start with what you do know. And some communities will be more missionally aligned, and so they might know more of the cause piece, but not quite the culture. And then some people are more culturally aligned, right? So they might know more about that, but not quite the cause, right? So you, you might be heavier weighted, but asking yourself those questions is a good start. But having conversations with the kind of people that you want in that community. So um, we kind of talked about this concept of like founders, you, all, you have to think of it like founders. Who are these people that I can get aligned with this cause and culture, the basics that I know about this? And that can be text messages, phone calls, but one-on-one -on -one outreach, I think oftentimes we try to just go to the masses first. And oftentimes I tell people like, if I told you today that I wanted you to find 10 people that you could personally reach out to that would want to be a part of this kind of community that you're creating who would those people be and if you tell me you don't know anybody you probably aren't in a place to start a community right but chances are you know 10 people and then i'm going to tell you talk to those 10 people let them know what you're trying to do and get it going right that's that's how we have to do this is to is to start with one-on-one -on -one conversations because we can and that's the best way to communicate and then over time, we have to scale it. But if we just start with those few people, it's just like how I'm starting this peer mastermind. I started out um, by having one conversation with somebody. And she was like, oh, I 100% would want to be a part of that. And I was like, okay, who else do I know that would want to be a part of this? And then I picked a few more people. And then now that they're committed, I've said, 
tell me one person that you would want, knowing the culture, knowing what we're trying to create here, tell me one person you want to invite to the community and make the introduction. And so now I'm having conversations with each of those women that they have said they want to be a part of the community. And over time, that's going to grow. Now, that's a small way to build it, but I've actually done this. I started a membership back in 2016, 2017, and I didn't have an online audience at all. I'd been a consultant since 2012, never like built a following, but I knew I wanted to start this community. I made a list of a hundred people that I knew. I reached out to them in various ways, text, phone, DM, whatever it might be. I told them kind of what I was up to, asked if they were interested and asked them to give me their mailing address. And I sent a hundred handwritten notes inviting these women into the community. And I had like a 70 something percent conversion rate, right? Like it, there are so many ways to go about doing this. I think we just have to start thinking smaller than bigger when we're first getting started. We think, gosh, I just want to have a hundred people in here. And if you have a following, maybe you will. If you already have an, an audience, it's pretty easy to to get that out there. But and the best ones start small too. That's what people yeah. never get. Yeah. You're able to start that foundation. Even if you have a big audience, I still recommend starting the community with your most intimate, loyalist customers first. Mm. Because again, they're the ones that you're building for, right? You're not building for the person that just saw that one random TikTok video that you did that exploded and got a million views. You're building for the person that is invested at their highest level, at your highest level, or has been with you the longest. That That's who you're building for. So let's create something for them and then they're naturally going to start attracting more people like them got it yeah it's not as formulaic as like looking at the analytics and data of a facebook ad which i think is why it can be such a struggle for people because it is more organic in nature yeah that's what i mean it's just totally different because you know you're looking for an ad that's just going to take off or you're looking for a video that's going to go viral but that doesn't happen to a community especially in the beginning it has to start slow yeah and really this starting small is better but i guess this kind of comes into conflict when people are trying to make money right like i'm guessing there's a lot of people that want to start a community so they can make money yeah so or have a community for a program that they're making money from. So like Mm. there's two two ways to leverage community. One is the free community where you are essentially nurturing people into becoming ready to become buyers essentially and building trust that they become buyers. Then there's the community that is part of a paid program, right? And supporting whatever is happening around that paid program. So you can have two of those. And the ones that, that typically jump from zero to 60 are the ones that like, I have a paid program. I just sold 2000 people into this course. And now I just put 2000 people into a community. Mm. What do I do? And that's where onboarding will make or break your community, like what you're doing to onboard your people. But are you seeing more people like wanting to make a community as the product? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So how would you recommend people start that one? I would still start it the same way, right? Um, it's just like... But free or do you get people to pay initially if you could? So if you have established authority and trust, 100% you can get people to pay because people pay for more access all the time, mm. right? For more intimacy. And it's it's all in the perceived value And I think oftentimes we talk about things like, hey, I'm starting this community thing over here, like come join it. Or it's like, hey, I'm really working on this vision for having a community of people who are doing X in this way. And I want you to be a part of helping me shape what that community becomes. And being a part of this community, here's what you're gonna get. You're gonna get more access to me, 
um, I'm going to be doing like a weekly town hall call where we're going to talk about what's working in the community or whatever it might be, but, or I'm just going to share with you my journey as I do this. Like you're going to get to see me grow from 10 or a hundred to 10,000 and you get to have access to that. And there's incredible value. We, we talked about this earlier, but I guarantee you there are people who would have loved to have been a fly on the wall as you kind of made that transition from consulting.com to school.com and to understand what was happening and how were you rebuilding things and what was going on inside of the headquarters here. And there's people now that would pay to come spend a day to be like, what, what do they even do? What happens? I just want the behind the scenes. And it's those things that we do so naturally and that we do every day that we don't perceive as valuable that other people perceive as valuable. So one of my clients has coaching calls and courses and all of this professionally developed stuff. And her most popular deliverable inside of her community is her behind the scenes video where she opens up her closet. She talks about what's in her wardrobe. She takes them on like, like when she's getting ready for date night, she's putting her makeup on. She's talking to them about like her makeup. Like they just want a look at her life and they want that feeling of intimacy that comes by having more access. And so when you are able to get people more access, hundred percent, there's value to that. And it doesn't have to be structured because you're telling them like, you're going to help me form and shape what this becomes. And there's people all the time who pay a lot of money to help be on the ground floor, to be able to be on the ground floor for companies like that or communities like that or memberships. And and oftentimes we're giving them a discounted rate because they're a founder. You know, you're gonna pay the lowest price ever. You're gonna be locked in forever. The price is only gonna go up, right? There's advantages to jumping in early, just like, there's advantages to jumping in with most companies and products. When you jump in early, you you get the best deal, you get the best rate, you get insider knowledge, insider access. It's the same thing when we're starting our community. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. You got to start small, organic, because there is really no other way. That's what I real. Well, what I realized is that I think everyone can agree the ideal scenario to be in is to have a community where the other members provide the value, not just you, right? That's obvious. And that attracts talented people that want to share. And that is so good that it grows by word of mouth and referral, right? So you don't have to do marketing and stuff. I mean, that's obviously the best scenario, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's what everyone should aim for, and I realize that. But then the only way to start that is small and organic. Yeah. And that just doesn't... So I guess you're kind of trading like short-term... It's that long-term, short-term thing. Because if you try to like just throw a thousand people in something and make it work immediately, you won't ever get to that end state. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've seen it done, right? But that's usually for people who have an established audience that already has a clear culture, right? If you're building an audience on Instagram or TikTok or email list, like people already know you have a culture, what you stand for, that sort of thing. And then you give them an offer, they buy into a program, and then they join the community that's associated with that program. Well, by default, they already have a common cause. They bought the program. The Mm -hmm. community is helping facilitate them and making progress in that program. Common cause by default. There's a path already there. The path is going through the program, right? That's it. They're going to know when they're making progress because they're working through the program. They're going to reach different milestones and see different results. And the culture comes, especially in the onboarding piece, just making sure that inside of that community, we have those clear guidelines that shape those beliefs, behaviors, and boundaries. But um, it when you have a larger community or are onboarding a lot of people into a large community or a large group of people into a community, whether you're first starting it or whether you're adding a whole bunch of people from a launch at once or whatever it might be. um, The biggest thing is onboarding. You just have to pretend like people know nothing and get them up to speed as fast as possible. There was this study that was done. Ah, gosh, I think they were, they were evaluating different like Reddit threads and communities and they were looking at like what 
what led to um, communities that were the strongest. And the challenge that they found and what I think is super fascinating is that the stronger your culture becomes, the harder it is to acclimate to a community. So hmm. if you ever joined a community that was had already been established for a while and that was a really tight knit community and they kind of had like their own insider language and it's hard to feel like you're a part of that community versus if you're part of one from the ground floor, you get to sh shape that. You don't have that barrier of not having established history, not having, you know, shared story, common language, all of those things that get established over time. So it's much easier to acclimate. So we have to set new community members up for success by speeding up their acclimation to that community by telling them like, here's the insider language you need to know, right? You're going to hear people saying these things or talking about these things. And that's what this is. Um, here's what, how, we, what we do. Here's how we show up. Like here are the kinds of things that people talk about. Here are our most popular threads, whatever that might be. We, we just need to give people an advantage and a leg up when they're the new kid in the group, because it's like being a new kid, moving to a new town or a new school. If you don't have that friend that comes alongside you and is like, Hey, here's the kids to talk to. Here's the kid to not like talk to, or watch this guy. He's a bully. Do like sit over here at lunch. If you don't have somebody to, to show you the ropes, it's, it's really hard and you would want to leave. And that's why a lot of people don't stay in communities that are already established when they join because they don't have that onboarding. They don't have that person showing them the ropes. So a lot of what I do with clients is, is creating that onboarding path that guides people in. So they get a, a personal welcome into the community. They get acclimated really easily and they're able to feel like they've established that identity and fit in pretty quickly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's not, I mean, it's all possible. You just have to be thoughtful about it. And that's really the goal with the framework is to give people who need structure a structure around how to be thoughtful about starting a new community or making the one that you have more engaged and thriving. Hmm. And why do you care about community so much? Oh, that's a great question. It, it goes back to the communal living aspect. So, um, when I was growing up, we, my family didn't have a really strong community tie. I had grown up in the same place my whole life and I had a lot of friends and connections, but my family didn't have a really strong community. And we went through something really traumatic when I was 13 and it was so isolating and lonely and there was not community there. We didn't have community around us. And so it was at that point that I was like, what? Like, I feel like I shouldn't be alone in this. And then I went through high school. I chose to go to a college where nobody knew me because I didn't want my high school, middle school story following me to college. And I got there and thought like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm not going to be known. This is going to be perfect. Well, it was pretty clear to me after a little while that as a human, I can't be emotionally healthy and not be fully known. Those two things cannot exist. So I had to go through this journey of like, building relationships and formed a, a really strong community there. And then I entered a, a new phase of life, moved back to Nashville, got married, moved away from the city, quit my job, became an entrepreneur and established the same, like had experienced the same sort of community shift where my community needs had changed. And I didn't have a community and I made some pretty stupid business decisions really stupid decisions that had I been in community, a hundred percent would have been avoided, but I didn't have it. And so, um, I got to a place in my life where I was like, community is everything. Community is how we survive in life. So I started a marriage blog, uh, speaking authentically about marriage. I started having wives nights at my house, gathering wives of all generations in my home. Um, I started, I was really into natural health. So I started having people over to my house to talk about like all of the natural health stuff that I was doing. And I started building communities around all of these different topics that I cared about because I wanted to share what I knew and I wanted to bring people's stories together. And I didn't realize it, but 
when I was in college, I was in the marketing space and in my senior thesis I did on creating, uh, building communities and marketing in Second Life, which was like the original metaverse online virtual reality world. And I was doing all of that from like a marketing and advertising space. But what I was doing was building communities online. My first job was working for a large academic medical center, moving everything online for them. So I eventually came to this path where I realized the very thing I've been doing in business, building, creating these online communities and trying to create spaces online for people with shared experience and interest to connect is the same thing that I'm doing in person. And I had a pastor uh, look at me one day and he said, you're like the neurons of the church. You just are making connections all the time. And I never knew that that was something that was so easy for me to do. And I had so much passion about because I didn't experience it for so long. So really for me, it's just been sort of a natural progression as the community space has grown, the need for it has grown. Having been in the space for 10 years, it's hard to find somebody that's been in that space for as long as I have. But I also have a deep passion for people being known and not feeling alone and having a safe space, whether it's in person or online, where they feel like they can go and they don't have to hide who they are or what they're interested in. And and that's what I get to do is is help the people who are creating those kinds of spaces. So it just it lights me up. Got it. And for people listening, like what is what do you do for like with your business? Yeah. Mm. Um, great question. Um, so I have the consulting side of the business and that's where I work with people with paid programs, courses, memberships, group coaching programs. And we leverage the kinds of strategies we've been talking about to help increase retention. So oftentimes everybody is focused on getting more people into the bucket and they're ignoring the fact that the bucket is full of holes and the water is just pouring out. The people are pouring out and the money is pouring out. So I work with them to basically create a full journey map for their members to make sure that we're leveraging community elements and human experience to create a really great journey that helps them keep their people longer, helps their people get more results and create stronger communities. Um, and then I have a, a training program for either community creators or their community managers and community teams that teaches them these strategies we've been talking about and gets pretty practical. Like here's how to develop a communication strategy Here's how to develop guidelines. Here's how to, you know, we go strategic and we go practical and give templates and all of that. Because what I learned is that I can, I can establish the systems and the strategy for these business owners all day long, but if their community managers don't also understand the strategy, then they're just functioning like a, an assistant that's just checking the boxes. And that's not what we need. We need people that understand these concepts and have the freedom to serve our communities in a a really authentic way, which can't be done with a bunch of like checklists, right? There's an aspect to that. But when you have somebody supporting you in your community who gets the bigger vision and these bigger strategies, you can give them more freedom to serve. And you can also trust them more so that you can uh, confidently step away without worrying about what's happening to your community while you're gone. Got it. And where do you want to take your business? Like, what's your vision for it? Oh, yeah. I don't, I mean, it's kind of interesting because there are so many opportunities in the space right now that have, I'm getting pressure from all sides. Everybody's like, start an agency, start a certification, start all of these things. But I do foresee a huge need for community managers, and it is the biggest gap in the space right now as more and more communities are getting started and business owners are finding themselves overwhelmed by their communities. They want a sidekick. They want a Robin to their Batman to come in, somebody that they can trust to help facilitate this community for them. And they're, they're just not skilled people to do that. And oftentimes what we do is we take our most active community member, make them a part of our team and think they can run a community. And it just doesn't work or that VA. way. Or right. I've seen that happen yeah. a lot. VA like is... it's a checklist, like 100%. reply to every new 
post. Yes. Yeah. Right. Reply to every new post, let them in and out of the group. And so my hope is to be able to get this community of community managers trained up because I want to create work, especially for moms, right? We have a lot of moms who want meaningful work. You know, there's a lot of moms that are VAs and I think that's fantastic. There are some people that really don't want to interact with humans. It's emotionally exhausting for them. They want the checklist, right? But there's a lot of them that are, they value relationships, they value connection, and they can't get that because they've got a two-year-old running around or they've only got so many hours while their kids are in parents stay out or whatever, you know, elementary school, but they still want to contribute. And so if I could take these moms and give them skills that allow them to serve in a valuable way with these businesses and to get human connection with somebody who's taller than two feet tall during the day and leverage the the wisdom and experience that so many of them have. They gave up their careers often to have a family. If I could get them trained up and then I have all these business owners over here, which I always have, who want a community manager, they don't necessarily need them full time. They just need them, you know, 10, 20 hours a week, right? If I can match them up, like that to me is is the ultimate win-win, right? Because now the business owner has this community sidekick that can come along and give them space to do their highest and best work. They can trust them in the community. They're facilitating that community really well. And we've created meaningful relationship oriented work for people that are otherwise isolated in their homes, you know? So that to me is like the vision I've been sitting with for a little bit. And it's kind of like, you know, if I would have asked you 15 years ago, if you would be creating a community platform, you'd probably say, no, you're crazy. But here you are and you've done it. And it's just one decision after the next. And ultimately you got to a place where you had to decide that's the thing and I'm going to do it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of online space, but not a lot of community. Right. Yeah, because it's just people just make a community because it's like, it's the thing to do. Yeah, it's not email. It's another way to communicate yeah, with people. Yeah, it's like that, right? Like, oh, I've got a funnel. I've got a, I've got a landing page. I've got an email list. I've got yeah. a community. Yeah. Um, and then they're just running it like it's a task. Like, oh, did we do these three things today? Yeah. But yeah, it's missing this for sure. And I think, yeah, you could definitely change that. Yeah, and. It's exciting for me because when we create a space where people can show up fully, then they begin to show up more fully in all aspects of life. They're, until we have other people confirm for us that our voice is valid, that our thoughts and ideas are valid, that we are valid and sad that we need this, but we do as humans, we need that validation. And without community, we we often don't get it, or we've been a part of a harmful community that has told us we aren't valid, and then we never want to trust community again. But if we can create that space and we can allow people to show up fully, then they're going to show up more fully in their life. And that's really ultimately what we want. Like, not to be the pageant queen standing up here and saying world peace, but at the end of the day... When people show up fully for other people and they show up fully in their life, like we get the best, we get the best businesses, we get the best schools, we get the best families, we get the best friendships. It's when we hold back because we don't have that validation or because we're afraid of what other people are going to think or say or do or how it's going to be received that we miss out. We miss out relationally. We miss out from an economic perspective. And and so I'd like, if we can just create these spaces where people can create these trusted connections, you know, it's going to be messy, but we're going to work through it. They can show up fully in whatever space and, and collaborate. And we can get that hive mind of, of having people who are working together towards a common goal, right? Just back 
to the basics of Think and Grow Rich. Like, how do we get people together who are smart people coming up with solutions for problems? We're all going to benefit from that. Mm. Yeah. And then world peace. <laughs> Not really, but you know, it it just it has a a bigger vision for me and I'm excited to see what happens in the community platform landscape. I think the the cool thing about stuff like you're building with school is you're building it with community at the center. It's not an afterthought. And you're seeing a lot of people out there that have platforms that are like tacking on community, just like people tack on community to their business. But to to have a platform that's actually built with community in mind first, it, it just opens up so many opportunities for people, business owners, nonprofits, doesn't matter what you are. Like if you want to build a community online, you need a platform that is centered around that. Yeah, I found that too. Like my courses that started as courses, but then there's also a community. They're not really like communities. The only real ones are like my mastermind where it started as a community and then the content came from the community. Yeah. And then it was just like recorded and captured and put somewhere. And that formed the course kind of thing. That one, those are way more engaging and people find them way more fun than the other ones because the intention of joining that one isn't to join a community it's to just get some content do you mm -hmm. know what i mean yeah mm. so yeah i i totally get it it has to be community first it's hard to add it as an afterthought and i see everyone doing that now like even for companies like i don't know like this like yeah. join our community yeah you know like you drink our soda or mm. bubbly water. Yeah. Now we're going to create a community around it. Yeah. It's like, yeah, interesting way. To... It's like the new Facebook fan page kind of thing. Yeah. Like everyone's got to have one, but no one really knows what it's for. Right. But I better post content on there because if not. And then automate it. Yeah. Just pre-schedule it And then it get out. a VA. Yeah. We're going to get a VA. Mm. <laughs> That's it. Mm. The solution for all things in life. Yeah, but it's exciting because I think the future of business is going to be the community first, and then the things will emerge out of that. Yeah, a hundred percent, it is. I, I people who aren't paying attention to this are are going to be behind. There's there's just no way with the place that we are in the business landscape, the place that we are just in the social emotional landscape, that we're not going to have this need for community focused businesses and community focused learning and community centered collaboration. We're seeing it in all areas, not just an online business. And we've talked about this, right? We're seeing it in in-person as well. Community, the online space is just helping us facilitate it. Mm. But the need is there. The desire for connection is there the desire to find like-minded people or to gather around like-minded intention and conversation, it's there and it's only getting stronger. So, yeah, I think... I think what's exciting for entrepreneurship is that, you know, the whole problem, if you ask anyone that wants to be an entrepreneur, like, what, what do you need? They'll say an idea, right? Yeah. Or, like... And generally they can't come up with an idea because they don't know a problem and they don't know a problem because they don't have a niche, which mm -hmm. is a group of people. So they really don't have a community, but they're just trying to think of an idea. Mm -hmm. So they come up with shitty ones. But what I've found is like the best things start with the community first. So like you find your community first, then you interact with the people and you find the problems. Then you can start working on potential solutions and validate things there and then the product emerges out of that right so i think it's going to open up entrepreneurship a lot for people because they can just find their people first which is way easier to do than find your idea mm -hmm. like find a group of people you care about 
then just naturally find out what problems they have and by adding value to the community you're literally like creating a product or a business you know what i mean do you feel like that's the path that you took with consulting.com because you were working with a ton of business owners you knew intimately what they were struggling with is that where the idea for school really came from was seeing that need in the marketplace because you had a deeper level of understanding of the info space and the online business space yeah well like in the course world i i had focused heavily on the content right and i just couldn't help but notice that more of the value was happening in the community side because people don't log into the content side that much and they don't actually watch the content that much a lot of people barely watch it right but they're very active in the community side and they meet up with people and they make friends and those relationships live on after the course is done. So like, and then when people succeeded, if you kind of reverse engineered how they succeeded, where did the value come from? It was interactions and relationships, right? All the content was really doing is bringing the people together around something, mm -hmm. right? And so it was just undeniable that that was where the value was. So I figured, well, you know, what are the problems with community? And the biggest one I could think of was it's on Facebook mm -hmm. because that's not exactly like optimized for community. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started thinking, what would a like really good community product look like? And and it, it, it answered so many problems for like the info business owner because you know, courses get pirated. You can't pirate a community, mm -hmm. right? Um, the one-time fee is a problem because you have to just keep finding new people, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're not incentivized to look after your people. Community solves that because it's a natural kind of membership thing, like a club, right? So now you've got recurring revenue and you're incentivized to retain. And you can't pirate it. And then if most of the value comes from the other people, then you don't have the burnout problem, right? Yeah. Which is the other one. Mm -hmm. So it made all the signal was there, right? And it just made a lot of sense. So that's really as you created school and you continue to see that grow with its feature set and everything else, is your goal to really keep it primarily a community platform that also can host some content, facilitate content, but not you're not trying to go out there and compete with the big like course and membership platforms? Not at all. Yeah. Now, our mission is funny. We went to Joshua Tree the other, like almost a week ago, with the leadership team of school to come up with our mission and well, not to do this we just went to like discuss the company but we all we defined our like values and mission and everything because mm -hmm. they were vaguely there but they weren't like codified and the mission we came up with is to help one billion people find community mm -hmm. so the course part is just a feature really you don't even need the course Right. But yeah. what, what I've found is that when a community's going, there's like these really like valuable pieces that emerge on a rare occasion. Mm -hmm. And they should kind of be captured and stored in some kind of like separate area for easy access. Yeah. yeah. And that's easy really difference. where the course content goes. Right. Mm -hmm. So it should naturally kind of emerge from the community and then stick in the classroom kind of thing and then be polished and codified and restructured over time yeah mm. it is such a it it's it's such an upside down way of thinking about it compared to how the rest of the online space has been doing it for so long so when you when you um attract people into school because you guys have a free school community right where people can go 
do you find that it takes a little bit for people that come in there to adjust to the concept? Are they trying to basically fit the course and membership content heavy model into it? And you have to sort of help them understand this flip and how to create their business. Oh yeah. Like most people don't know what to do. It's almost scary. A lot of people want to turn community off. Yeah. Yeah. But we're like, no, there's other platforms for that. You can't actually turn the community off. Um, So, yeah, that's the biggest problem I'd say we have at the moment. However, people figured it out, and then they are the people that have kind of, like, stood out in the community. And the more of those people stand out and share how they're using school, the more customers we get and the more groups are created because they have an example and a model to follow. Yeah. That's exactly how it works, right? Mm. Is we get people in, we help them get results, they share those results, and ultimately we end up getting more people in and the people within the community get more motivated to create the result. So it ends up being this, like I call it the progress wheel where we just identify that purpose, give them the path, they take action, they see the result, we spotlight the result, and then it just cycles around keeps them in motion and keeps your community in motion as a whole. Mm. Well, I'm excited for it. Like I, I love the concept that you're talking about and the fact that you're building, building it with community in mind first and not just thinking about it from a software perspective. Like this is the kind of SaaS product I want to have, but you're actually going, we're not, we're not just trying to create a different kind of, system or or software we're we're actually trying to change the way that people build their businesses and build their programs to make it more valuable for the people participating and for the business owner and more sustainable yeah it's actually extremely painful to make a course i don't know if you've ever done it yeah it sucks yeah and it also isn't very fun to watch it on the other side yeah it did uh in-person workshops and then live beta course and then had to the thing that took me the longest was actually making the like evergreen version of the course and also because I knew like I wanted it to be like short seven minute or less videos because man it is hard to get people to move through content like that Mm. it's really challenging and I think that's why it holds a lot of people back because there's so much creation on the front end, whereas a community, you can start tomorrow. You don't have to wait. Yeah. Except it's scary. Yeah. Because you don't know what's going to happen or if you're even going to be able to solve it. You just, you know what I mean? It's like with a course, you get to control everything and give all the instructions, then you give it to people and... Yeah. But no one likes it. So... Your community is a totally different paradigm in almost every way, it seems, from what we've been talking about. Mm. It is. Maybe that's why I like it. It's different. It's challenging. They're all different. It's just like people. People aren't the same, so communities aren't going to be the same either. And that's part of the challenge and part of the fear is it's not formulaic, you know, and, and people always want, like, hey, what are your scripts for how to respond when, like, somebody goes crazy in my community. Like, yeah, there is no script for that because you are a unique human and how you want to run your community. This is a unique human coming from a unique situation, but most of us don't want to slow down long enough to factor in those things. You should see the things I hear. I hear like, can I turn on like post approval for people? Can I disable DMs for all of my members so they don't DM each other? Oh yeah. And I'm like, why? And they're like, I don't want people to organize together to get refunds. Yeah. Oh, and I'm that like, holy is, shit. That like, happens this, all... There's this a is lot not, of... Yeah, but how are you going to have a good community if yeah. you... That's craziness, yeah. Yeah, and, and... And then the scripts, and then the... Can I have a scheduled post? Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah, and I, and it just goes back to that, like the automation and all of that stuff can be a great tool when you understand the intention behind 
what you're doing, right? So the problem is, is that major the majority of people don't understand it and they use it as a way for them to look like they're showing up without actually showing up. And then when it comes to like the post moderation and all of that kind of stuff, you know, I have clients that do that and I understand why, but again, like they're, they're always, we're always asking the question of like, okay, why, if we, if we have to put somebody on post moderation, oh, why are they in the community or like, what are we trying to hide or what is happening here? It's never something that we're just like, no, we're not going to do this. And I, and I think part of the challenge is, is when you have a community on Facebook where the majority of communities are, by default, people are used to using Facebook groups to spam, to come and get, not to give, not to collaborate. They come, they post these posts that make it seem like they're asking for help. And then, oh, by the way, could you like look at my lead magnet and read it and sign up for my email list and then go to my sales page so that I can get a retargeting link and then retarget you with ads. Now they're not saying that, but that's their intention behind Mm. showing up in the group. They think they're really sly, but they're not. People go in there all the time, posting links to stuff, posting memes, sharing political posts into people's communities and, and Facebook in particularly will, will hurt your community if that stuff gets shared in there. So, I mean, people are on Facebook. A lot of times they have good reason to, really be closely monitoring their communities because of the nature of just Facebook in general, which is why a lot of people are moving away from it, right? They're, they're moving out of that because you can't, it's like people, people try, they want to create this little place in Facebook that reflects the culture that they want to reflect, but they're surrounded by crap, like noise of Facebook. So people just, they saw some political post or something in their feed that made them mad, right? Like, and then two seconds later, they see your group or something from somebody in your group, but they still have the energy of that like political post they just saw. And they're Mm. bringing that into your group. Like there's no, it's hard to energetically separate your group from everything else that's happening to them on Facebook. So you end up getting a lot of residual, whether it's family drama, friend drama, uh, you know, jealousy over somebody's vacation they just posted, frustration over some political thing, and then that bleeds into your group. And so naturally, there's a lot more stuff that comes up inside of Facebook communities. And you get people that are showing up by default, which is to your advantage a little bit. If people already have the habit of going to Facebook, they'll see things from your group in there. But it's also a disadvantage because your community Mm -hmm. people can be like kind of in your community and kind of not. And then all of a sudden they pop in because they've got some comment to post on somebody's post, but they really aren't engaged. They don't know this person. They don't know your culture. They don't even really have fully understand a full understanding of the conversation. But when you build your community somewhere else, you're able to create that culture in a more isolated way where there's not all this other junk. They're in a different headspace when they come to your community. And those that are there are intentionally there. So the level of conversation shifts. And people always say like, well, I'm going to experience a big engagement drop off when I move from Facebook. And you probably will, but high value engagement is probably going to go up. So you'll get a lot like less like likes and random stuff that people get because something shows up in a news feed, but you'll get a lot more high value conversation when you move your community off of Facebook and you just have to weigh the pros and cons of that. But either way, the onus is on you to, again, trigger people to go into your community. And that's the biggest challenge that people move off of Facebook have is like, well, now nobody comes. Well, no, because they're not checking that community when they wake up and lay in bed in the morning, right? You've got to give them a reason to go there. But the trade-off is, is when you do a good job of giving people a reason to come and giving them high value conversations when they get there, that you have a much more facilitated community that is isolated. And again, they're just in a different headspace. So it doesn't require 
as much of those like moderation tools and things that you need when you're in this like chaotic space of Facebook and just the culture of how people use Facebook. People use Facebook to uh, start drama, engage in drama and sell stuff, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's definitely other people using Facebook for good things, but generally there's there's kind of that culture on Facebook bleeds into your group. But when you have a community that is off of that, it's a different headspace. It's a different kind of conversation, level of conversation that you can get. Mm. Yeah, I think it is to be approached with a different kind of philosophy too, because a lot of people are, are in their communities because they've bought a product from them and they don't want to refund the person because they have to give up the money. So like that now they've got the wrong people in there, but now it makes it toxic. So then no one uses it. So then there's no real value and then no one's going to refer their friends. Right? So now you've got to spend all of your time on marketing. Now you don't want to contribute to your group because it doesn't bring you anything. So you get the VA, you automate the posts, Mm -hmm. right? It gets worse and now you've got to spend more time on marketing. So it is a burden to you, right? So that yeah. I think that's how a lot of people arrive at community. It's like, oh, it's a chore. But the way I kind of thought about it is the if the ultimate goal is to have a community so good that it the members provide the content and members refer their friends and talk about it and that's how it grows, then what other task do you have to do? Do you know what I mean? As the yeah. owner? So then it's not a burden. Right. It's actually where you put your energy. Mm-hmm. And then it comes back to you. Because, yeah. do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's a... But you have to stick with it and iron out all of the kinks until it does that, which takes some patience. Yeah. And you have to kind of sacrifice the short term a little bit. Yeah. Which people are terrible at. Um. It's the long game of relationships, right? Like, relationships are the long game. But well, every good community I know of just was built that way. Yeah, well, and relationships will outlast everything in your business. You carry your relationships with you from business to business. I was just interviewing uh, my friend who's releasing this book about this, but she talks about the importance of relationships because they transcend offers, businesses, whatever it might be. It it's definitely the long game. It takes a while, but those are much more high value. I mean, I I bet you when you made that switch with your mastermind community and made it more collaborative, that those were a lot of the people that have been involved with school from the beginning, right? Those relationships transcended that product. And now they're probably in school. They're probably some of your best users and best advocates because they had already built trust and relationship with you inside of that mastermind community and that happens but it takes time Mm. they even funded it yeah yeah so a a lot of them invested in it yeah yeah so it really does come back around Mm. but i didn't used to do things that way i used to spend most of my time on ads yeah Mm. yeah you built a big business doing that and burnt yourself out and feel like there's a different way. Yeah. And I think everyone knows it, but they're just scared at the moment. Yeah. But I can tell that it's happening. Yeah. Mm. It is. And the best way to overcome the fear is to be in a community of other people who are trying to do the same thing. Mm. and learning and that's what i mean i know you have your your free community for school and right now a lot of the conversations around features and that kind of stuff but more and more that conversation is going to be around facilitating the communities that they've created right it's going to go from how do we use this tool or how do we get feedback on this to how do we create stronger communities that we built on this platform and being in that space where people are having those conversations is the best way to build the courage to start because you know you have a community of people that got your back when you're not sure what to do. Mm. Yeah, that's what's emerging now. Yeah. It started out like we can't use this because it's missing X. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of that. 
and then there was just you know working through all the features first then it got good enough that people were using it and then it was like we don't know how to use this so then it was like use case needs so then a few people kind of emerged with their different ways of using it and they taught that and now there's just a lot of management kind of things like how do i run this thing how do i make it good or yeah like a lot of the questions i was asking yeah which is what you're good at our community needs you yeah mm. come hang out hang out well i'm gonna dive in more i've been in there a little bit lately trying to start some conversations i just like hanging out with other people that care about community and are creating communities to me that's that's what gets me excited right because there's a lot of people are there many of them no interesting yeah no there's why there's not a lot well because i think um oftentimes it's like what you said people are starting with the course or the membership first right so they start with the program content and they're joining programs that are program content focused that are facilitated around program content. And then you see the ones who actually have success in those programs start going, well, wait a second, I, I added a community to this because you, know, you said I should, now what do I do? Mm. And that's where I end up having just a lot of, of one-off conversations with people about what do they do? How do they grow that um, community? How do they facilitate it? We talk a lot about it at a mastermind I'm involved in because they all run membership communities and have a community as a big part of it but because our space is built around the program content and you add the community you don't actually experience the challenges of growing communities until you've had success in your program which most people won't and then secondly until you have heard conversations like this or you've witnessed a community that's different, you you don't know any different. Like you don't know mm. that there's more. So you're not thinking like, how can I make my community better? Do you know what I think better? it is? Yeah. I think it's people like want to start these businesses and make money, right? Which fair enough, you need to make money to live. So they, the course is just the easy thing to sell, right? And then they figure out like ads or email newsletter, landing page funnel, whatever. Then they get people in and then they add the community is the like afterthought. And it doesn't really matter if it's very good or not, because it's mostly just customer support, really. Yeah. It's not really a community. It's really a course with a with a public customer support system, I'd say, right? Yeah. And that's it's a distraction to them because it doesn't make the money if they put time into it. So they're trying to put money into ads and content and to get traffic to make more money, right? And that's why they're saying I need to turn off or or block people or do all of this because the the um byproduct of that is people are like people aren't happy, do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, because of how it's being run. And so everything's just out of balance, right? But people don't I don't think people even know that it's possible to make a community so good that people want to use it, that it's so valuable that people would pay just for that, that's so good that people would invite their friends to the point that you don't need to make content or do marketing. So then you, it's not a distraction. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. And you've actually done that. Like you did that with your mastermind community and then now taking what you learned from that and then giving people a platform that can help facilitate that for them. I mean, I think it's huge because it, I mean, there's definitely those people that just want to build their thing and sell it. And that's, that's fine. Like if that's the route that you want to take, but there's massive, there's massive opportunity, not just for, for money, but for, I think impact when, when we look at this like community focused approach, but yeah, it'll be I think interesting a, to see how it all plays out. Yeah. But I think that's why there's so few people interested in community because it's seen as a chore. Yeah. Not as the key to unlock 
the business. Yeah. It can be the product. It can be the marketing engine. And it can be like, it can be everything actually. Yeah. Like what you're seeing with the companies like Chief, right? Right. Um, there is no content. It's just the people and hanging out and it's growing faster than any course business. Yeah. So I think more and more people are going to discover this and the tools are kind of emerging for this to happen too. It's just hasn't quite caught on in the, you know, the old paradigm of the internet is you just make content. You, you know, you make TikTok videos or you make YouTube videos or you, you run ads, right? Or you blog. Mm -hmm. It's very isolated. Mm. Yeah. Versus you create a community that's so good that people can't help but talk about it and share mm. it. Yeah. I think that's what's changing. Yeah. I just did a, I recorded a master class for somebody for their community for predictions for 2023. And one of the predictions, well, there were two risks. One, one was that people want more intimate communities. And the other was that your traditional way of getting business with Facebook ads and all of that isn't working. And the solution for that was creating a community so good that gets people results that not only do they not want to leave, but they want to tell other people about. And you know, how do we do that? And I think that's what we've kind of laid out is this is where it starts, right? And and the best way the best way to move forward with that is to get get your toes like get your toes wet. You have to get in. You have to start running start a community. Start one and start small. Yeah, and yeah. get to know people and find out what their problems are and try to facilitate ways for collaborative solutions and learn from that and add more people in. And, you know, I think oftentimes we are afraid that in starting something, we're committed to it for life. And this is often a fear I see with people wanting to not wanting to start communities because they don't want to have to run one forever. You and know, I, the good ones aren't a burden for any of the people that have them. Exactly. That's the other thing that's interesting. Yeah. I asked them, do you pay anyone to like do the moderation? And they're like, no. Yeah. I'm like, do you do much moderation? They're like, no. Do you market it? No. So like, you know, there it's not a burden. Right. The ones that are run poorly are the burden ones. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I'm excited for more people to to share about that. Like what they're doing and how they're because it, it plays out so differently with different people. There's only yeah. a few. I'm not even yeah. kidding. I run my mastermind like this, but a lot of people say they haven't been to, they don't know of any other ones that are run like this. They've turned into these keynote things where a bunch of external people come with keynotes and just speak. Mm -hmm. There's not even room for someone to ask a question or like discuss. Yeah. They've just turned into that. Yeah. Or coaching programs mm. with the title of a mastermind. Yeah. yeah. And, and well-run communities, I don't know many of them like, so they're rare. So I guess the people that want to do it are rare and obviously therefore the the amount of them are rare, but it makes a lot of sense. It does. I feel like we've solved all the world's community problems with this one podcast. If somebody doesn't listen to this and have everything they need to go start a community, we've done something wrong. Or they just didn't listen because this is I feel like this is gold. Yeah. It makes sense, and I've seen it work. Yeah. I'd like to hear the reasons why not. Why not? What? Well, like, why someone wouldn't want to do this. Yeah. I'm guessing it's just because you have to sacrifice the shorter term, and you have to be willing to just have faith in a way. Like, I'm going to yeah. get this group of people together, and we're going to figure it out, instead of I'm going to figure everything out and then just... Yeah. Yeah. It's a different, it's quite a shift in thinking. Like a lot of people can't believe that I don't have an agenda for my mastermind. Yeah. They're like, really? How do you do that? Aren't you scared? And a lot of people can't believe I don't have celebrity external speakers speak at my mastermind. The question, they often say, you don't have any speakers. I'm like, no. And they're like, the next question is, 
well, how do you get people to show up? And I'm like, are you serious? For the other like, people in the room. I send an RSVP post and I say, are you attending? And people say yes or no. Yeah. And 80% of people show up because they want to hang out with everyone else. So I was like, what kind of community only comes when there's an external celebrity there? Yeah. yeah. So the, the thinking around it is just so distorted. Mm. But yeah, I am curious why. I mean, people can what email you, post a comment below. <laughs> Let us know why after listening to this, you would not want like, what is your reason for not starting a community? Because there's got to be more of them or more people would be doing this. So I'm curious too, like why people aren't aren't doing it. Mm. I mean, there's so much business value, so much more affordable to keep a customer than to get a new customer. It's so much more profitable. It's so much easier to have people who, let's say you have paid programs and products, it's so much easier to convert people who have already have an established connection to you and to what you're doing that you've built inside of a free community. You can create so much more faster in the collaborative environment of a community. I mean, there's just so many benefits and it doesn't have to be burdensome and take up 80% of your headspace and your time like people think it does mm. when it's done well. And if something goes awry, it like you just pick up and move on. There's not, I mean, I think they're you not know another gonna... thing I think it is influencers aren't very good at community. A lot of them, I think. Why do you think that? Well, think about what an influencer is. A famous person. Yeah. Famous people are always isolated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lonely yeah. and not they don't hang out with they're not even called a community. They're called fans. Right. And fans aren't really like looking at each other. Right. They're yeah. like looking, looking too. Up. Yeah. yeah. So you know, Plus, it's hard for them to actually have a proper conversation with someone that's a fan because you know what? That's they're all, like, they're yeah. always on a pedestal. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just distorted too much. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, that's true. They don't, they don't experience that a lot. And I think there's also that struggle that we've talked about where if I have, especially for influencers that have come up in the social media space, if I have built my bid business on my own influence and celebrity what happens when i create a community of a whole bunch of other people that want to be like me or trying to be like me and i give them the stage essentially what's going to happen to that can i trust this That's process what I did. you know yeah and it worked it worked for yeah, you which is surprising because i didn't do it on purpose i yeah. only did it because i had no time yeah. To be the person. But I would have thought that if I don't have enough time to do this thing, to be the best at it, then I am, if I'm not the best at it, at it and I'm not the expert, then people won't pay to be in my group because I won't be the best at it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Which I think is the r logic everyone's going through. But then just I was forced to not be. So then I'm not going to stand up in front of my master. And then, you know, I wanted to keep my mastermind because I did like it and it was making a lot of money. So I didn't want to just kill it. So I kept showing up at the events, but I would stand up there and I'd be like, what does everyone need? And they'd say like YouTube ads. And I would think, oh shit, I don't know YouTube ads. Yeah. But what, it was funny what happened. I looked around in the audience and I was like thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? And then I saw someone in the audience who was really good at YouTube ads. And I just pointed at him, Brian Moncada, and I said, you know more about this than I do. You should come up here and speak. And then everyone just started clapping and cheering like for him. Yeah. And then he crushed it. Right. Because he lives it day in and day yeah. out. Right. And there's but only so many things valuable. that you can be an expert And I was in. like, holy shit, what have I been doing 
stressing was, about creating yeah. stuff for so long. And then what's surprising is that that's when people, like Brian then shared that little clip of him on YouTube and stuff because he was proud of that moment, right? Yeah. So then more people joined the mastermind and then it got more fun and people would tell other people about it and refer people and stuff. And then because we let other people shine, more talented people would join and then it would get better. So it all, what's surprising is like, it actually got better by not, by doing the thing that you would swear would just make it fall apart. Yeah, exactly. Mm. We're crushing every objection right now for people who don't want to start a community. I don't think there's any other excuse on the table at this point. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, the thing that makes the master, my mastermind work is some, because I've asked people and they say it's just your level of passion for the space that, br and the fact that you've brought all these people together because you're so passionate about it, that is what's making it work. So you don't actually have to be the, the smartest person at every individual thing. Right. You just have to care about it the most, I think. The space. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which comes back to caring about your people, right? Like yeah. you care about your people, you care about... So start by mm -hmm. finding the people you care about. Forget about how you're going to make money. Forget about how you're going to create a product. Forget about all of that. Just start with like, where are the people you care about? And then it starts from there. Mm -hmm. That's why I said I'm excited for what it's going to do to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship because it's way more natural and organic to start a business this way. Yeah. Mm. Way more fun too. Yeah. And more hum human. You just talk to people and hang out and add value to your people and then it kind of takes off. Yeah. Mm. That's good. Sign me up. I want more of that. <laughs> more community. Well, where can people find you online? Uh, just go to my website. What is Shan that? It's shanalyn, S-H-A-N-A-L-Y-N-N.com. You'll see my podcast there, consulting. My podcast is called Community Creators, naturally. And we have these kinds of discussions and conversations around communities. So, yeah, it's the best place to find me, the website and the podcast. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. And hanging out more in the school community too. Schools. What it what do you how do people even get to that? They just go to school.com, right? School with a K. And then when you get in, the first thing you get essentially is access to It's pretty bad right now. You community. actually from the website, you just create your own group. Yeah. And then you learn about like school community kind of later. It's all... It's, we're going to reverse that. Yeah. We're, we're gonna, by the time this comes out, I'm sure when you go a, to the a, website... It'll be a bit later than that, <laughs> but we are going to fix yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because that's where I think people need to start, right? They need to plug in. They need to see... They need to see it modeled before mm. they can do it themselves. Yeah, that's what we learned, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. This is fun. Thanks for Thanks. having me.